Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Russell Wright, Network Empire. Matt DeCruz is here with us today, all the way from South Africa. Sue might poke her head in occasionally to crack a whip and or do what she does, which is to make sure that everything stays in order and uh, just occasionally to torture us for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to see if she's here. That, you, that usually gets her attention, but I guess not. You got to hear the. the <laughs> uh, no, she has been. Uh, the whole team has been incredibly busy, and uh, now that I see that you're all here, let me just um, get a one from y'all. Hi, Stephen, Luke. I can see you. Uh, can everybody give us a one if you can hear me? And Matt, you should have heard Matt just laughing. Okay. Hey, Pat. Hi, everybody. Good. Hey, Pat, Stan, Bill, Charles, Welton, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for the discipline of making it here to this event. And I believe we are – can everybody see my screen? Let me just double-check that. Uh, give me a one if you can see my screen. System sound check. Okay, good. <clears throat> Fantastic. Good, good. Hello, Stan. Did I say hello to Stan already? I probably did. Yeah, okay, we still have some people coming in. So today is, first and foremost, I would like to let everybody know that I uploaded. I was delayed in the upload for a couple of technical reasons for last week's webinar. It is now in the webinar archives. Um, usually I have it up the next day, but had a couple of issues. So it is now there, and hopefully everybody knows uh, well, I'm in the wrong location. Matt sent me the location this morning. Let me go back to the members area. Um, <laughs> the links, links in your Skype's right? Skype's off. Um, that's okay. I'll oh, just right. I'll just navigate there. First of all, how um, Stan is asking when does the Kraken subscription start? When we first open it? Yeah. Basically, what happens, guys, is you'll put your help desk ticket in. Um, Kev will get that. He'll create the Kraken account. It'll then go down the queue to me. I'll then proceed to drill out your keywords for you. If if your keywords have a few queries around them, I'll contact you and speak to you directly about that, just to refine things. I'll draw them, and once that's completed, I'll respond to your help desk ticket informing you it's done. Plus, I'll give you a, a a file with all your keywords in it that you can use for DWS later on, any silo builder. And then, when you're ready, what you do is you contact a Kevin through that same ticket. And you say, okay, Kev, I'm ready for this date to that date. And you get seven days that you can book. Um, before, we should just turn it on. But we found that, that often life kicks in, people's work commitments uh, take precedence. And it's better when you just tell Kevin, okay, this is the week, I'm going to use it. And then you get that four weeks access to, to get in and carry on with your research. So let me see here. Uh, guys, just as a reminder, which one of you, this is the first time you've taken this course. Because we are a perpetual mastermind, uh, that we have a lot of people taking advantage of the recurring uh, tenants, and I, I really love that. I'm glad to see you guys here. So, But it is helpful for me just to get a distinction. Just give me a one if this is your first time so I can give you that extra attention. Starting to get pretty full. <laughs> okay. Not that I'm going to give anybody else less attention. I just need to make doubly sure that those guys who are new uh, have actually – okay, so Stan, uh, Stephen, and Mihai, and – have you um, – I'm having a difficult time pronouncing your name. Is it is it Rue? Did I pronounce your name right? Is it Rue? R-Y-U? R-Y-U? Can you give me the phonetic pronunciation of your name? Yes, Rue. I got it. Sweet. Cool name. And then Charles. Okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to – which one of you guys who are new to this have finished your uh, – I'm assuming that you've already finished your – market research and your ISDNA, because if you've given Matt, you know, theoretically you should have gone through the, the stackable system, so you guys are following me, right? I just want to make sure that we got you. Not yet. Okay, Rue's still working on it. Okay. So you might take a couple of rounds of the training, Rue, if, that, if you're still working on that, which is fine. Okay, Pat's working on it as well. All right, so really, just a reminder of where we're at, Matt, you can jump in here. You should have gone through this section, and this is a big kickstart for people. 
and then give map, you know, you need to give map those keywords, right? And then we've started to talk a little bit about the technical stuff, everybody following that, right? This is the general stackable. This is the stackable system for dummies here. I created for myself because I'm a dummy about this stuff. I actually literally yeah. built, I, I literally built this for myself because I get lost really, really easily. I have a very short attention span. What I would say, Russ, um, if the guys haven't spoken to me yet, yeah. uh, when they get to step two, create yeah. your keyword DNA, EKDNA, right. um, they should have a chat with me first. This sort of thing helps them with the, the, their perspectives of how to look at the keywords. Because uh, uh, often a common mistake is that the people create the ISDNA for themselves rather than for the market personality. They sort of roll back to their, their own business and what they do in their business rather than what the pain is and what the market personality is looking for. So it's just to help them align that. Gotcha. Okay, good. Um, and so today we're really talking about ADNA and VDNA because I know you guys just love my acronyms, my genetic acronyms. <laughs> How many of you guys love genetic acronyms? And, and give me a one. And if you hate it and you think it's convoluted and you think it's strange, give me a two. I really love to know. I, I really love the feedback. I love it when you guys just tell me how it is. And you're like, because that's how I've built, that's how Matt and I build everything. Sue as well, is we get feedback from you guys. And if something doesn't resonate, then it doesn't resonate. Okay, you guys, Pat was saying, I was starting to grasp it, and then it was confusing. Okay, that's good, Pat. That's what I wanted to know. I, I liked it, but hey, one person's metaphor is another person's nightmare. You know what I mean? It's just it's all part of a culture. But I think, have you guys noticed how in a lot of business uh, practices they use the word DNA, like your business DNA, even like internet marketers are using it now. The reason they do that is because DNA, and you'll learn this in Tech Foundation too if you guys ever use it. Yeah, Pat, Pat Cranny is saying DNA equals building blocks. Yeah, that's probably Pat's way of telling me to not launch off into a lecture about DNA. <laughs> Damn it, I wanted to do that. Well, I just love it because you know what I'm more interested in? This is why when you guys take Tech Foundation 2, uh, especially week 3 when I'm talking about uh, meme stacking. You guys know what memes are, right? M-E-M-E-S. Isn't it weird that I can say you guys know what memes are and like all of you say yes? And then four years ago, I was using, even five years ago, I was using the word memes. I was like way, way early adopter. In fact, that probably helped get that word you know, at least partially established in internet marketing. Uh, memes, I remember my girls, my daughters, used to make fun of me for using it. My 16-year-old daughter came to me uh, seven months ago and she said, Daddy, you know when I was making fun of you for using the word memes and now it's everywhere? She was like, wow, I get it. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I always get, I've always gotten teased for being uh, ahead of the curve, and this is not in any way bragging or anything like that. I'm just saying that the entire team is kind of cutting edge. But it is weird how... You know, one one person's early adaption is the next decade's culture, right? So DNA has been the same thing ever since we've studied DNA. So it's really a great way of stacking memes. And the word DNA is what we call loaded language. Because it's building blocks, it can imply, when people imagine DNA, they imagine a whole bunch of other very organized principles hanging on to that. And that's what makes it a powerful meme to use. Well, that's really cool because when we're using a DNA, building blocks, we mean article. That means the building blocks of an article, just like Pat said, I think that's the simple definition. You know, DNA equals building blocks. Okay, so we're talking about the, the, the building blocks of an article and the building blocks of a video. And so when I came up with that term, I was thinking it would be pretty easy to understand this and that. But if DNA makes no sense, then it's just convoluted. So we've got that. So already, you should have a pretty good foundation. What's cool about our system <laughs> what is my, Marina saying? What is mimes? Well, mimes are those guys that hang out down on the park, and then they have their face painted white, and they make all these gestures like they're in a box and trapped in a box. Marina, I'm I'm just kidding. We were actually talking about memes. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead, Marina. I'll drop a. Uh, we have a definition of memes in our wiki, and we do talk a lot about in Tech Foundation too. So when you guys graduate and move on to the new advanced course, we get seriously deeply into how to use memes as a weapon. And uh, that's a significant part of marketing. In fact, you'll start to see how memes or ideas, loaded ideas and loaded language are stored everywhere and how to use them uh, to overtake culture. There's an amazing book. I'm actually a, a fan of Chris Brogan. 
and I'm hoping to actually get him to be able to come on one of our calls and talk to you guys. He wrote a book called The Impact Equation, and he's, we have a lot of similar thought processes on how to use memes properly for broadcasting. Let me just go ahead and, so if you go, um, I'm going to drop a link in here just so, so Marina knows what the definition of a meme is, because our spin on it is a little bit different. And so I'll go ahead and drop that here in your, I thought I had a link to memes in, in this area. A meme is any idea, Marina, that can be replicated by culture, either through individuals, through advertising, uh, or even through just mere neurons. That is the idea that we, there's an excellent book by Richard Brody called The Virus of the Mind. I know it's a little bit of a nasty looking image on there, like your brain is being injected by ideas, but in some ways that's actually happening. And the, the interesting thing about this book is that if you look at viral marketing, I mean, how popular is the concept of viral marketing, right? Give me a one if you've heard the concept of viral marketing or if that's like a to totally new concept. Okay, Pat has. Good. I know you have, Bill. Rue has. Okay, almost everybody here. So it's not a very... Hi, Benson. It's good to see you again, buckling down and... Benson's a certified advisor. It's really great to see these guys coming in here. Uh, a meme is a unit of culture that can be replicated with variation and or selection. Okay, and there's something called mimetic Darwinism as well, just like there's genetic Darwinism as a theory. Mimetic Darwinism is, is all the ideas around you, including the ones you're learning here, have pieces and starts and building blocks in other locations. Okay, and they, they grow and evolve, and only the best ideas survive over time. So there's all kinds of memes, but not all of them last. And, and those memes spread for various reasons. Okay, and what's interesting is that there's biological, psychological, and cognitive definitions of memes, right? Okay, so some memes are quite dangerous because they're not accurate. What's very interesting, you guys, is that memes can pass from person to person whether they're true or not. And in Tech Foundation 2, we'll get more into that. So Tech Foundation 2 Week 3 is really about for anybody who really wants to use the power of memes and ideas to A, become immune to other people's really bad ideas, or B, use their own ideas to infuse culture, uh, and it does actually make you a lot of money when you become a meme master. <laughs> I probably owe, I don't know, a couple million dollars to my ability to sling memes left and right. Okay, so we'll talk more about that at a later time. But that's a basic understanding of a meme. It's a good idea to have because everything is a meme, and we try to keep our memes very accurate. In other words, we want them to be scientifically valid. So the cool thing about your article DNA and your video DNA that I love about our stackable system is Matt's already done the work for you guys by taking your keywords that you should have derived and extracted from the pain, right, in the market. We talked about, hey, I've got a problem. You know, that's the comic book version of it. I have a serious problem. How can I solve my problem? Google, Google, Google. Oh, Solution to problem, your website. Oh, buy button. Cha-ching. End of story. That's like money getting in a nutshell, right? That's the transactional velocity, right, of the web. But a lot of people forget that there's a problem, right? Okay, they're talking to human beings. So the more you find out about that human being, okay, or as Jean Mizell talks about the fanboy model, where you've got, you know exactly what this person looks like. You know, instead of just being a shadow, this is what Matt and I were talking about early on. It's an actual real person. His name is Fred. He's got facial features. He's a real avatar. And so you're selling to that person. And as soon as you start humanizing the process and you create your structure, then you're ready to start talking to that person. Step four is really about talking to that person. <laughs> okay? So that's really where we're at. So how many of you are ready to feel like, here's a great question for you guys. How many of you feel like you could have, forget an article or a video for a second, how many of you feel like you could have a basic conversation with a person who you're targeting for their specific pain in, the, in your current market? Give me a one if you feel like you could hold a conversation, or two if you feel like you know so little about the market that it would just be this embarrassing conversation. You couldn't talk to Fred or Lucy <laughs> about their pain. Okay, every single one of you feels like you can talk about this. So that means that you are ready 
to move on to the next step. This is the article creation, all right? So let's go into that since we're on week four. What week are we on, Matt? Yeah, week four. I don't even know what day. What day is it? What month is it? Yes, if you click on, that's the one day. What is it? It's like February. I don't even know what month it is. It's February. Okay, cool. 5th of February, 2025. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, so this is actually deceptively simple. So we're here. Link number three, the painkiller content one for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Painkiller content is the this is where the rubber starts meeting the road. Okay, I use the Instant Article Factory sometimes. It's not a software that we own, but it's just one of those things. It's one of those cool little things that is so simple and yet so powerful. We have some enhancements coming to our own version of this, which will be a little bit different. There's no ETA on the arrival of that. It's a very inexpensive application, so it's something that you might want to consider. Um, the components of a, the reason that we choose the painkiller article model is because those types of articles are, are easy to cut up into sentences. So have you guys ever taken an article that you've written or used and tried to break it down sentence by sentence and imagine each sentence is a tweet? Give me a one if you've ever tried to do that with any article. It's a good thing to start doing because this is what Social Explosion does. Okay, some of you are saying no. So the reason we designed Social Explosion the way that it was is that, take this paragraph, for instance, okay? A key topic discussed in Network Umpire's stackable system is the Pam Painkiller article method. If I tweeted that on Twitter to a target audience that was pretty much, you know, maybe 50% in the same interest, do you think that that would get a click? Give me a one if you think it would get a click, and two if you think it wouldn't. Yeah, most of you think it would. You'd be right. <laughs> but there's some, you know, you never know what's going to click. But the question is how much. You don't really. Vincent's saying maybe. I like Vincent's answer because he knows that he's supposed to test everything. <laughs> so what you need to do is you're going to test your headlines, and you can use things like Bitly or clickable tests. We have a system coming <clears throat> that's part of all this, the perpetual uh, keyword uh, money machine, which we've been designing for almost nine years. Uh, the spec is in its latter stages now, and you'll and you'll be able to use things other than Bitly Tracker and these other things, or your own trackable short codes. It's actually kind of complex to be able to track everything across the massive network. Uh, but really, the painkiller article method is designed so that most of the sentences in your article, when they're shredded by social explosion, which we designed to do this, or if they're shredded by you that they have a high click-through rate or a high interest rate, a, a, high, a high rate of interest. Since culture is now living on memes, meaning, what is it, 146 characters or less or something absurd? Marina asked when she first got in the room, like, what is a meme? A meme has pretty much been reduced to the size of Twitter, more or less. So painkiller method was designed to, when we sat down and we wrote the painkiller method, Here's another sentence. The painkiller article method is one of the most powerful clickmatic styles of writing. Okay, and I don't know how much of that sentence. That sentence is too long for Twitter. But that meme could probably be broken down, styles dot, 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 and would probably get some click. People would see painkiller article. That might be intriguing. It might not, but you'd have to test it. The painkiller article method should be uh, more clickable on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence breakdown than your average article. Okay, so that's really what we're getting at. Let me give you an example. It's a lot simpler than the way that I write or talk as well. Three things to avoid. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, somebody toss their topic into the ring here so that I can just have some kind of example. Give me your topic or your theme that you're going to talk to Fred or Lucy about, your avatar in your market. Lead generation. Three things to avoid when generating leads for your business, okay? Title, three things to avoid generating leads 
if, if that's your keyword. Okay. You could be also more specific, three things to avoid when adding a lead form to your website or something like that. You know, you could do anything that you wanted to. And again, the simplicity of it is create a body and just have these, these little fields here should be the pain points that are easy uh, to, to give you several definitions of. And then when they get tweeted out, they're probably going to get some attention. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. So what you're going to do, this, this article is just a flat article created by, I think it was by, not John Ledger, but I think the original template writers was, I always forget his name. He's an excellent, he has an excellent online courses on how to write for everybody. But these are taken right out of his arsenal. You can see each and every day you might find folks who log out of the net and type, who starts right with that point, into the online search engine window. They confirm whatever they keyed in, blah, blah, blah. Were they thinking it? What were they thinking when they did that? There's an almost limitless range of, right? Okay. So I probably wouldn't take that for lead generation, but I would write an article that's three things to avoid. Okay, so here's what he's doing is he's saying, it is important to know that you must create content that provides something of value before you ask for a lead, more, that creates something of value. More specifically, you must know that asking for a lead, up, more specifically, you must know the increased risk of pop-ups when providing content for your audience in this particular industry. You understand what I'm saying? So these are the types of things that we're looking at. People should stop calling me during my webinars, don't they know? Okay. Um, yeah, and Bill is saying three things to avoid better than how to avoid. Okay, that's good. Bill is asking, should I use a headline of three things to avoid versus how to avoid? I like how to avoid. It's interesting but incomplete, right? Okay, let's go to uh, one thing to just keep in mind. If you guys are ever wondering about where you are, uh, you can go to interestingbutincomplete.com and get some pretty good ideas. Let's just go through that real quick. The idea is the idea is to to know what kind of content you're creating. This is a larger view than just the article, okay? This is the way that the brain works. So generally speaking, the reason people will stick with your content is that it's either insightful, informative, or intriguing. And I think it's very important to break these down because these are how this is how memes work. The reason that meme sticks, is a meme will stick, is usually for uh, these three reasons. But here's another weird thing, you guys. Insightful really doesn't have much to do with a meme. Memes don't have to do that much, don't have to have that much insight. They just have to be sticky or short enough to stick. And there's a couple of different reasons that you can read about in Virus of the Mind by James Brody that talks about why. But generally intriguing has to do with the reason that a lot of memes stick. Uh, that's something to do with novelty in the brain. Does everybody know what novelty is? Novelty means new, or you haven't seen it before. For whatever reason, the human brain has evolved to be rewarded by new things. I think that's part of the way that Mother Nature just wired us to keep moving forward and create more and more unique, interesting innovations. It's just part of the evolution. It's really what separates us from monkeys. You know, so intriguing is just something new, interesting. Notice that memes are interruptions. How many, how many times have you been surfing along and you log into your Facebook account, you're trying to have a productive day, and all of a sudden there's this really weird video of some guy doing some crazy thing? A guy got interrupted by a meme yesterday of a guy who was pulling a, a sports car with his eyeballs hooked up to these hooks. <laughs> you know, like weird, like his eyelashes. Like crazy stuff. And I completely, to I must admit, I totally stopped what I was doing to watch this completely intriguing, interruptive, and really, really gross video, right? And I'm pretty good at, at ignoring and, and tuning stuff out. But remember, Facebook's job is to make sure that you stop what you're doing. And they it, see how powerful that is and dangerous? It's like they're literally interrupting you, you know, in the middle of my day, my, you know, and I'm $1,000 an hour, and I'm watching this video with some weird, you know, guy doing this weird, trippy thing. So that's intrigue, distinction. It's an addiction almost. So what I'm showing you here is the interesting but incomplete is your expert consulting model. <clears throat> your job if you're an expert consultant is to make a transaction. 
you don't do anything for free. Okay, you want to make sure that you utilize both intrigue information and insight uh, towards a transaction, towards something that you've given of value, and there's a buy button for them to get past. A lot of people you'll find are doing, they're utilizing these three things, but they're giving it away for free. And people don't know where the free line is. They don't have, they don't know how much. They confuse platform for product. Give me a one if you understand what I mean, the difference between platform versus product. You know what I mean by a platform? Okay, not enough. A platform is the entirety of your network. It can be one site, like Network Empire News is a platform, right? So your blog, okay? Anything that you're using to communicate with your audience, it's also your, apparently I don't know how to type it into the, the browser though. Um, anything that one or more blogs, your, your WR2, everything on the You Everywhere web ring is your platform. In fact, we're talking about building a content broadcasting network. That is your platform. Any of these sites that you own that will contain your material and communicate your anything that you want at no cost is your platform. President uh, Barack Obama, when he got into office, had a massive social media platform that still today intrigues social uh, uh, scientists and technologists alike worldwide because primarily it's his massive platform that allowed him to get into office and literally sway the public into his perspective. He had, a, he had used a platform that was new and emerging at the time. So the platform is any kind of broadcasting location that you can be talking to the audience and to the world. And it's also a location, generally speaking, that you can be listening. See, a lot of these platforms that we have out here, um, when it comes to listening to your audience, in other words, listening to what, that what they have to say or talking back and forth to them, it's not happening much at all out here. But the closer that you move in to the inner circle, the more you should be also listening, and it should be more of a conversation rather than a one-way talk. The further that you get out on your web ring, the more you're just talking one way out and you really don't have that much, of, you don't really don't care what people have to say out here because you're only broadcasting. But the closer you get in towards your money site, towards your core business model, then you need to be talking to your customers and listening to what they have to say as well. Okay, so the platform and the content are two different things. The platform and the product are two different things. And that's really what we mean by interesting and incomplete. People confuse uh, this free, the online monetization model is out here where everything is free. You know, like when you create a PinVid site on certification level free, level three, you're generating sometimes a million pages a month or more with weird and unusual videos, right? Funny stories, crazy people doing weird things. This is what makes Amazon actually run right now. <laughs> things like BuzzFeed, you know, all the things that create this addictive environment. When you're broadcasting those, you're broadcasting those out here. Okay, you're not listening. Your own your your platforms are only talking. A lot of the times they're talking about other people's stuff, but the banners are, that are syndicated on there, you're broadcasting your banners to drive them back to your site. So you're creating a banner or a call to action that is congruent with the topics and weirdness that you're broadcasting out here. And then every once in a while you're also broadcasting your own content out here. Does that make sense? Give me a one if you understand that. That's the part. That's really what Tech Foundation 4 and 3 is all about, okay? But it's kind of, there's a nuance here, you guys, and it's like, wow, getting a lot of ones. Some, some of you guys had a light bulb moment. Okay, good. Um, so that's a platform. So, you know, the platforms can be personal or impersonal, and the further you get out toward the outer web ring, the less personal those platforms, those broadcasting platforms become. But also, you'll see, I mean, have you ever wondered why, you know, you hear stories about guys hanging out on Wikipedia? I actually know a couple of these. I know a lady uh, called the Wikipedia Dominatrix. She's the one who gets, she got uh, Perry Marshall's wiki page entered. She spent something like 50,000 hours already in the Wikipedia platform. I mean, guys, Wikipedia is like a completely voluntary platform. It's vol all volunteer. And these guys are rabid fans. Like some of them are spending up to 10 hour days on, days on Wikipedia, kicking other people off and accepting other people. The Wikipedia lady, Perry Marshall's friend, uh, she's an amazing gal. She can get you up on Wikipedia like in no time flat because she's so she's been around for so long. She's like the old, you know, black hat Wikipedia person. If she doesn't like an article, all she has to do is boom, you're off the island, right? 
But my point here is that that's all free. Can you imagine like sitting around and writing those high quality articles, bu building this platform and with zero transactions? See, there's no money up here. There's no transaction happening at all. Can you imagine that? You know, what you should be doing, when you're writing that kind of content, you can see that I have a wiki, you know, with a lot of content. But, you know, in order for us to build the wiki, like the one I just dropped for you with uh, with memes, this is our own wiki, there's over, you know, 500 entries, okay, on this wiki. This is very carefully orchestrated to drive people back to our money sites. See that? Okay, all the top, there's a congruent topic related to what it is that we're selling. And we didn't build this first. We first had to make money in order to afford to be able to build it. So that's what you call complete information. But that complete information should drive you back. And other people are spending a lot of time blogging, you know, like they think that they're going to make money blogging. They think that blogging is a business. Okay? They think blogging is a business. How many of you guys think blogging is actually a business? Is actually your business? Give me a one if you think blogging is your business or two if you don't think it's your business. Come on. Pat saying hell no. Well, you guys are no fun. Vincent saying it can be a business if you monetize it. Uh, Vincent, I agree. Yep, it can be if you monetize it. Blogging is something that you have to do because you don't have any choice. <laughs> it's you developing your platform. Okay. The question then becomes what, how much and of what quality do you blog? What do you communicate? What's that platform? And how much information do you provide? Well, you should be interesting but incomplete. Because remember, we're dealing with insight. My least favorite thing to provide on my blog is expert insight. Okay? But at the same time, my favorite salute thing to add to the blog is uh, interesting but incomplete solutions and insight. And that's what, the, that's what the painkiller marketing article can do. You can give them three things to avoid and make it very, very incomplete. And then at the bottom, either have a banner or a link or your opt-in, you know, so that they can get back to your site. So you want to give them enough information that they want to seek you, that they'll seek you out, okay? And then that information, they'll go to an autoresponder and then either a free consultation or uh, another thing is content locking. You know, you can have content that's half in and half out. For the, for the rest of this, if you'd like to remember that uh, radio show, the rest of the story? We'll be back in five minutes with the rest of the story, right? How many of you guys have seen that? Give me a one, or heard that. What was the guy? What was his name? Anybody you guys remember the rest of the story guy? I can't remember his name. We'll be back in a moment for the rest of the story, the cliff, cliffhanger. And then, of course, they'd have like 20 minutes of commercials. And yeah, Paul Harvey. Thanks, Dan. That's embarrassing. Paul Harvey was, he, Paul Harvey was the, <laughs> he had, he, <laughs> that guy, caused more commercials to be listened to than almost any other television because <laughs> nobody's going to tune out, you know? So they got that monetization happening between the rest of the stories. It's a brilliant idea. That's what we have as interesting but incomplete. So you got to know where the free line is, okay? Good. So let's go back. So in the process of creating your articles, the whole purpose of these articles, the reason I t went down that detour, the purpose of these articles is not to give people a complete and comprehensive compendium of the things not to do. Okay. The thing is to give them a complete compendium, a, 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 not a complete compendium, but an interesting but incomplete insight into the things that they should avoid. What happens that is that as soon as they know that there's things to avoid, they start to seek out expert advice. And when they know that there's things to avoid, they wonder if there's other things to avoid. It's subtle, but it's there. Okay, if there's three things to avoid, there might be ten things to avoid. And you can mention that in your article. So you just des it's just designed to help people feel a little bit unstable, enough to seek out somebody who's more stable in their knowledge base to kill the pain they're already having. Because remember, if somebody is reading an article, three things to avoid, you've done a little tricky thing, you've created a little bit of pain, or you've made them aware about the pain that they already have, which is uncertainty. Okay, it's really about the uncertainty principle. And you're, you're aware that they already have uncertainty and you want to go through further into it. Okay, so you can see how easy these templates are. Exactly what things should we avoid and why would it be important to avoid them? 
for you to handle the challenges along the lines of, you see just how general this is? Okay, what is the challenge? You're the expert, so you can know this. Okay, Mon maybe monetizing your list, or could be knowing when to uh, ask for the lead. Pop-ups are a huge controversy, for example, in the lead industry. So what you can do is you can take all of these and put them into a really second look at there's just all gap, 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 expert, expert knowledge. Why is this important? Boom, boom, boom. How can we understand or know, know it's enough? Okay. So by avoiding these three items now, I've timed myself. I've gotten to a point in my level of expertise that I can mill through one of these in under 10 minutes. Okay, and that's just gotten to a point. And if you want to, you if you use the article factory, you can actually spin about 40 to 45 versions of these that are actually incredibly readable. Okay, if you wanted to do that. Now, I'm not talking about spinning for SEO. I'm talking about spinning spinning for knowledge position and spinning for uh, just to maybe a different format or context. Now, I usually only spun like four or five of these because that's all I really needed. And you don't even have to do that because you know you can just put. If you're using Social Explosion, you can just put this article and it'll go down and it'll, you know, each day you might find folks who log onto the net and type, okay? Well, when that goes out, if it's a painkiller solution or answer, you'll be able to look right at it. Okay, so let's go back and see where we're at now. So that's how the whole thing evolved. It's how to be persuasive. The most persuasive thing there is is information where people don't, where people are looking for a pain to their problem. Remember, Looking for an answer to a question is still a pain in and of itself. It's a micro pain. Okay, and sometimes it can be a major pain. It's just a question of, you know, where they stand. All right? So one of the things that you're going to do, let's go back over to this. Now, the things to avoid, that's one position. Let's look at a different kind of headline. There's more than just avoid or how to avoid. You could also do five reasons you should or why you should. Okay? I'm a little bit partial to question marks on headlines because it's interesting but complete. I don't know if you've noticed that I try to give you guys the best uh, perspective here. A question mark itself is kind of an open loop. You guys ever notice how a question mark is like a hook? On its, you know, if you turn, put a hook vertically, it's like a question mark. That's a good way to think about it. That's a good mnemonic or memory. Yeah. <laughs> Pat like leaves two question marks. Okay. A question mark. Um, I had a drawing of that. I just don't know what I did with that. I had a drawing where I took a question mark and turned it on its side and it looks like a fish hook. Well, the reason is that, you know, when you ask a question, the, the brain is wanting an answer. Okay. So, for example, did you ever notice how a question mark looks like a hook? Question mark. Okay, the first thing you want me to do is answer, like explain what I'm talking about, right? Well, what's going on in the brain is that the brain is designed to close loops. Okay, if you've ever taken any kind of any kind of time management program like David Allen, you know, or any of these other things, he calls them open loops. The brain is essentially an op is a cl loop closing machine, and what it does is it wants to get the answer. So the reason that headlines that have a question mark generally get a much higher click through, not always, but generally get a much higher click through, is that the brain, by the very mechanism of what the brain is, wants to close that loop. When a question is asked, if the question is of even remote interest to the brain, it will click on that headline to try to find out the punchline of the joke or the answer to the question. You know what I mean? It's like, or the conclusion of a movie. You know how like you're going through a movie, and you're watching this movie, and the, one, the, the ones that are real, you know, you're on the edge of your seat, and you want to find out what's going to happen. A really, really good movie is interesting but incomplete. It takes you to a point where you want to close that loop. You don't want to leave. You just want to get to the end of the story. Have you ever read a good book where you just couldn't put it down? That's the question mark being developed in your brain. And really, really good writers and storytellers can, can hook you with that question mark so powerfully that you just can't leave. It becomes almost an addiction. Does that make, give me one if you guys understand what I'm saying. I can move on from this point. Because it's actually a really, really big deal. I know it's not a, a friendly way of looking at it, but the the job of the marketer and of the and of the entertainer is not that different. That's why the time that we live in is so strange. We live in a time where entertainment 
is the, is the new currency. The entertainment values are actually driving culture. And the line between marketing and education and marketing is getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> so you've got this place where keeping people on the edge of their seat, telling your story, and giving them something, something of interest and information of interest in a way that is entertaining to them is very, very useful in most industries. Not all, but most. Okay. So this is why we write the headlines the way that we do. Remember our stackable persuasion theme to keyword to headline system? Can you tell me uh, what you mean, Bill, by more hyperbole today? I have to remind myself what that means. Sorry, Russ, can you hear yes. me? Um, could I just say something here for two minutes is with regards to what you're going to enter into now with the stackable system persuasion, yeah. this whole process you're going to take the guys through. Guys, um, what Russ is going to take you through now at this moment in time is essentially going to help you when you think about the keywords for your silo architecture, the themes, the verticals uh, a few you and I have been speaking about today. Pay attention to what Russ is telling you now because this will also help you simplify the whole process so you can do them really, really quickly because this is a point where a lot of you guys have been getting stuck. So I believe what Russ is going to tell you now is going to give you deeper insights to what I've discussed with you guys personally on the calls already. Yeah, and even to reduce it to its, you know, we're getting a little bit abstract and theoretical, I know. I got you on the on the hyperbole, Bill, yeah. And I was getting at something just a little bit different than hyperbole, although entertainment um, is a huge part. Um, there's a friend of mine, two friends actually, Alexander Bard and Jan Suderquist, who've written a book called Synthism, but they've also written a book called The Future Eco Trilogy. And if you don't have it, it might be, I've talked to Jan last week and I'm trying to get them to actually put it on, on audio because ain't nobody got time for that to be reading these days, which is my point, which also speaks to my point. <laughs> um, I mostly listen to books on audio between doing things. But we're in an attention economy where visibility times credibility equals reputation. The Future Eco Trilogy is probably the most accurate futurist book, maybe besides uh, Jerron Lanier that I've ever read. Jerron Lanier's uh, very interesting Who Owns the Future. But I think Who Owns the Future is a little out of reach for most people in terms of reading. Um, probably not for you guys. But what, what Alex and Jan are talking about is visibility times credibility equals your reputation. And reputation is very important. So hyperbole can't go to, I was just thinking something about something that Bill said. Hyperbole can't go to a point where it's unbelievable. You want, you want to get people's attention, but once you get their attention, you want to keep them entertained. And money follows attention these days, not vice versa. So this really has to do with video and how we're living in a world that's almost like a technocracy moving towards what he calls an autocracy, where you the information can't be false in essence but it has to be entertaining. And entertainment may not be like a play or a movie, but you'll find that organizations that take time to create a, a video on YouTube or this or that, and I'm, again, I'm not that great at this. I, I try it, but we've never put the kind of money into creating edgy marketing material. But that is uh, very, very interesting stuff, you know, and it's something for you guys to consider. So really all you need to do with your five reasons you should. You don't even have to like try to fill in the blanks. Like if you know that you're selling uh, five reasons you should, you know, five reasons, you can actually, you know, come up with those reasons. And just jot them down. First come up with your thesis. Okay, and if you're in the lead ga gathering business, it would be add, and that's very technical. Should we maybe do an example with one of the students uh, on one of the projects for us to make it? Uh, I believe that I am. I think uh, this is somebody's sure. somebody's niche. Five reasons that you should add an autoresponder to your site, right? Okay, so that's lead. Who's in the lead ag? Some of you is in lead ag. Yeah, most of the guys are. Okay, five. Mm. 
Um, who's the person doing Agile development? That's Charles. Charles is doing the Agile and, and Mariana and Marina is uh, helping. Okay, good. Uh, Charles, give me three things that you should avoid. Let's just do Charles. Okay, let's do the avoid. I like the avoid because I like people to feel the burn. <laughs> but first, let's do this. Yeah. Let me just do the autoresponder, and then we'll get down to Agile development. We'll do an exact five reasons you should blank add an autoresponder to your site. Guys, when you're doing this, just get a notepad. You can even do this outside or on your front porch or a cup and a cop, drinking a cup of coffee. Five reasons you should add an autoresponder to your site. Just add them down. Just go boom, one. I use uh, audio notes on my phone. Yeah, use audio notes on your phone. Follow up with customers to extend your reach. Again, these are things that you can explain. Monetize. I know this seems really simple, but this is where it's at, guys. Monetize your website blog, and you could even get into that thing that I already talked about. How many of you think that blog is your business, right? Okay, the blog's not your business. Capturing an audience and extending your reach. Okay, for Okay, and if you and here's another thing, if you guys run out of reasons, just stick to what you found. <laughs> you don't have to be an expert. Go to three reasons. And you're done. And then this fills in it fills it actually writes itself. Does that make sense, you guys? Charles gave an example as well. Okay, so Charles is gonna give me reasons. We're gonna go with just go how many reasons. Start with three. I found that starting with three really gets your dopamine flowing. If you put ten you're like, oh my God, I can't. Yeah, just go with three. Three reasons you should incorporate agile, agile development. Oh, actually, three things to avoid. Let's do that. Three reasons. Three things to avoid. When incorporating agile. In fact, give me a headline, uh, Charles. He's got one there. You should you should avoid transforming your organization to Agile without training. Yeah, that, I absolutely agree with that, actually. <laughs> my, it's been my experience. Um, you can copy and paste that, maybe. That's okay. Uh, I'm just get, showing people how to trick, create notes. Okay. Um, sure. Don't start without training. What's really interesting is you guys can take a lot of this into your own business. So these are some universal principles. Okay, and he can get really specific in this. Um, I would actually add um, something like that. Charles, I don't know, you probably would say that. There's a lot of negative stuff about Agile from people who don't want to change or be accountable to their um, results with Agile development. <laughs> Charles is saying, yes, there is. To me, I think this is a pretty big one. And I would probably get more specific, like rather than don't believe the hype, uh, you know. and uh, think, avoid the hype, I would just say. Yeah, avoid the hype. So that would be a pretty good one. Avoid uneducated negative opinions. And what's really strong about that one is you can explain why that happens. There's a lot of development systems that either the, the organization's too big to, and they don't want to change. The big one is don't, they don't want to change. <laughs> they don't want to be accountable uh, to their results, which I find very, very interesting. But yeah, Charles, this would be like really, really good. This would be, I would actually put um, this one first. Don't start without uh, training. Don't start without coaching. And then what, you would, what he would do here is he would just follow the template. He would explain what happens. Now, what's cool about this is you might find yourself, generally speaking, when people are passionate or skilled, they do a whole lot more than what's in the article. And you find yourself writing a book. Try to avoid the tendency to write a book. However, you can use these same principles to actually create the outline for a book. And there's some rapid prototyping and Kindle applications out there that will give you, there's some pretty amazing thesis software out there. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, 
let me give you some quick examples of that. Yeah, we've got, uh, are you guys familiar with, um, oh, what was that software? I wanted to share that with you. Really, 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 really good. Um, dang. I'll go ahead and give you guys an update, but there's, I'm actually exploring a lot of book writing software because really what you're doing is you're taking this stuff to the next level and it's just creating this amazing outline for you. Okay. There's some there's certain like formats. Just follow some basic thesis. There's a, a bunch of different thesis softwares out there. I'll probably just give you guys. How would you? Mm -hmm. Russ, how would you incorporate? Um, so the guys get the keywords back from Kraken now. How would you use Kraken in uh, the marketing sense to f choose words to use in these headlines in the copy? Well, I would use it like, what would you right use? here. Um, you guys should watch watch the video uh, where Matt and I get into that specific topic. But what you want to do is like obviously a lot of these topics you should already be at the point where you know what you're doing. For example, agile development. And I think Charles, what was the it's not agile, it's an, a specific kind of agile development. I would uh what is that again? So for let's take Charles, for example, in agile development. Agile development was probably the root term. What's kind of weird is if you go into certain platforms like Cora, you can even type in the word Agile, and you'll get a few other things back. But So Charles has got a specific kind of Agile called Safe Scaled Agile Development. So this is a modifier, but his essential term is Agile Development. And probably I would have to do some work, and he's probably already done this work, so forgive me, I'm not really, I haven't done the research. Agile Development, Agile Software Development might even be a modifier. So these are like your modifiers, okay? So what I would do here is um, you're going to want to avoid uneducated opinions, op opinions, opinions about uh, agile development. Okay, so if he's going to go for safe scaled as a modifier, I actually like to do that because this whole thing is a shingle, meaning it's all overlaid. Yeah. So uh, let's just go ahead and look at that. So if I'm Charles, Agile development, it, would it be really totally cool to be on page one for Agile development? Yeah, it totally would, even if he's doing safe scaled. Charles is going, yes. <laughs> um, and it's entirely possible um, with what we're talking about here. If you have, my, my point here is this whole overlap here. Vertical, his vertical theme is probably, if you, if you wanted to go all the way up, for example, in Kraken, I would drill into Agile. And you're going to get a bunch of different Agile stuff down. It's a very, there's many, many reasons for the word Agile. There's other types of Agile products and services out there. But essentially, Agile development's getting a lot of momentum on the web, so it's probably a good piece of that puzzle. If you were to do a, a pie chart of the word Agile and all the industries it's tied to, Agile development's going to be starting to take more and more of a piece of the pie. Okay? Yeah. Um, so I would still drill into it. That's what's Kraken. If you don't have Kraken, well, I know you, you guys have access to it. I would probably drill into Kraken just to see. I'm sure that Matt did for Charles. Um, Agile development uh, would probably be the next thing I would drill into. That probably is going to be better, even than Kraken. Yeah. What the guys, what I've been saying to the guys, Russ, is exactly what you showed Good. them. Um, and this is going to re they get they get they getting to see the reasons why from the marketing perspective now because uh, we've done exactly what you've stacked there we've done with the guys where they've looked at the vertical theme then the next one down then the the themes related to this stuff so it's perfect what you said good it's good brilliant. and I just want to make with Char with Charles's stuff because I like agile development I'm partial to it I've got all these books sitting here on it so I kind of like it um, so I'm actually this is actually very real I'm actually showing you a, this is how I would do it. Uh, I would, of course, my goal would be to rank for agile development, and you guys just understand that that's that's kind of a lofty goal, like that's pretty, but it can be done. And but my point here is that there's no reason why Charles shouldn't include the shingles. Okay, there's development, right? There's software. There's agile. Then there's software development. Look at all the keywords you have here when you extract this. Okay. There's the word development. Is Charles trying to rank for that? No, that's a bit that's a bit broad. Software development, dang, that's a multi, multi, multi million dollar term. Can he rank for that? Well he could, but that's a long way off. He shouldn't target that directly. Agile software development, can he rank for that? Totally. And yeah, I've been terming those keywords, placeholder keywords. 
the high in traffic, but do you want to use? Yeah, that? well, you'll back yourself into those, as Matt described, over time. Sometimes you do, but they're they're not your direct target. Uh, you want to stay focused in your industry niche, and that's agile. But safe scaled. And so, and safe scale agile development. What's going to happen is by using these terms throughout your article, you're going to start to get the. They're called shingles, when things are overlapped. Once you have your shingle, meaning your skin, skin rash, skin rash balm, you're not going to always have them in the same sentence. For example, so if one of the pains is, uh, Charles might not be able to put his pain into the shingle, but he might be able to, like. Uh, Agile development, agile software development fears. Yeah, that's a good okay, one. that would be an example of a of a perfect shingle that includes the pain. What about myths? Does those, those type of fears and things? Do you use like fears myths? Yep. Exactly. You could do. Um, you know, once you really think about what's going on, and this is part of what Pain Finder is really about. You should have already really done this. Um, myth. Yeah, they've done a good job this year. The, the, the stuff's been really good coming back. Um, what, have, what happens in the brain when you actually add those fear type of words well, into the actual sentence? Well, when you add things like fears and myths, this isn't, there. I'm really interested, I guess the essential thing that I want you guys to know is by adding words like myths, losses, fears, myths being a big one, uh, fact or fiction being another one. It creates a contradiction. Wherever you have a contradiction, you have an open loop. The whole purpose of these articles is to create an open loop where people fall down a slippery slope and do more research and read your, you know, they're intrigued by what you're saying, right? It's interesting but incomplete. So let's go have an, a little bit of a look. We have 39... Yeah, what you'll see is don't fear change, okay? So that you can actually go back to fear, fears, and you, these are the kind of things that you begin to write down, okay? Don't start with a coach. So what do I have? I've just got a new, change. Now that might be a little bit too commanding. You have to give them a reason. In fact, this might be an entire article, right, Charles? So what I would probably do here is I would say uh, three ways to avoid fear of change when incorporating agile development into your organization. Okay, because one of the big things that the software developers have is they just don't want that change. And But there's actually probably two or three things that you can do to make the transition from what I call industrial or court or enterprise software development methods, which simply means duct tape and strings and, you know, build a, build a bathroom inside your living room kind of software architecture. <laughs> Let's put this room over here and this module here and, you know, just no, no real coordination. So you really want to talk about, well, what would a manager do or a software architect do to bring that in so that people have less of a reaction? So these are the kinds of things I'm talking about. That would be, avoid fear of change. So you could say avoid fear of change. All right. So actually use pain finder and other things to come through this Teams rally help, blah, blah, blah. So that's really what we're looking at. Again, it's the overlap, the overlaying pain. And then you can re-sequence them. Uh, you don't always have to have a question. Balm for skin rashes, are they safe? His article could be agile development, is it safe? <laughs> agile development, does it work? See how it's a question mark? That's a hook. Doctor recommends ointment for, you know, he could do what I call an ego, uh, what we call an authority. You know how four out of five doctors recommend that's been around since Trident launched their gum in 1970? <laughs> Remember that? Well, that works for a reason because our brain is wired for authority. You can easily do authority. If you're a branded, a well-branded, like Dr. Oz is a well-branded thing to the point where, you know, it's almost diluting the definition of doctor. But you can also do things. You know, agile development expert, or you could do you know, uh, multi-million-dollar software developer explains how agile development saved him. Well, you could do that kind of headline. So there's different things that you can do, but for the painkiller article, they're the simplest ones, okay? Because you're just going to overlap the important things that you're targeting. So each time, don't fear, uh, you know, change when, and you can mix it up a little bit. 
when incorporating, you could take another version of this, okay, safe scaled agile software. So you don't do the same keyword every time, safe scale agile software. You might do one version of it might be agile development. And then another time, for example, in one of these sentences you might use agile, okay, don't start without a coach when introducing, when starting, getting started. Okay, you might do agile to software development. And on this one, you might do agile development without the software. You see how that mixes it up? Give me one if you understand that, generally speaking, don't try to, I know what you guys' next question is going to be. How many times do I use my exact keyword? And how many times do I use a variation of it that's pure diverse or partial diverse? I know you guys are going to ask me that. Guess what? For that, you can go to Jimmy, Kelly, and Sue. But I'm just happy to get an article out there that is decent and communicates and doesn't have the same keyword 5,000 times. Okay? Jimmy or, or Sue or even Matt can tell you there's a con, but there really isn't. As soon as you start trying to get overly formula where you have it precisely five times this, you know, safe scaled agile software development and precisely three times agile software development and precisely one time the word agile, you know, nah. don't, don't, I know I shouldn't have to say that, but I do get this all the time. I remember talking to somebody, they were, they, they'd taken the certification level one course four times and they still didn't create a painkiller article. And when I found out what was holding them back, I had to write a three reasons to avoid when writing content for SEO article for them. <laughs> avoid content uh, avoid fixating on keyword density that would have been that would have been reason to avoid number one <laughs> reason number two yeah, avoid avoid waiting for perfection when writing your let me finish Matt avoid waiting for sure. perfection when creating your SEO articles or your painkiller articles three avoid confusing SEO articles with painkiller articles all right those are the three things that you should avoid so don't, go ahead, Matt, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say um, exactly what you're saying. Don't ever think the technical guys. The, you, and you can start really working your site as soon as your site is live. This is why the first version, get it out there and apply what Russell's showing you because then you're going to write good copy that's easy to think about. Mm -hmm. This is the whole point. It is, right, exactly. You, you're selling to people, not selling to the robots. People, when you communicate your market personality and you tell a story in a way that's easy for them to understand, but you 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 incorporating these words. That's right. These are the words that they, they're looking for. So when they ask scans of the page, they're going to pick up those words and they're going to slow down. That's right. That's what you want. That's right. And and another little secret here for you guys, put your energy into it or the energy of your client into this. Charles knows his stuff with adult development. And what really matters is his expertise. Okay. What really matters is what matters to me about Charles's empire that he's building is to not take this insight and lose, he should be spending less than 10% of his time over here. And if possible, he should have other people doing this stuff here. Give me a one if you guys understand exactly what I mean by doing this stuff in here, meaning this is free, okay? Full consultations, don't be doing that. I don't even want to hear about it. Otherwise, I'm going to get a plane ticket. I'm going to come to your city, and I'm going to slap you. Like, I'm <laughs> seriously going to, you guys. I know that's being, I'm, I'm mostly kidding. But you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to make a point. Don't be, the only thing that Charles should be doing is writing a book or having a book ghostwritten on agile development. It's important. It's the future, right? It's a big deal. I'm actually an advocate. It's a really big deal. I mean, I, I can even use, I even use Advil development and managing my family affairs now because it works. I get more results from my kids and I behave as if I'm doing Agile development. And you can do stuff like that. There's a TED talk on Agile development and organizing your family. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's, something that, that's something that you could put on your article, on your blog just for fun, you know, and then drive it. And it's not un completely unrelated. It's kind of funny. It's humor, you know. So, yeah, persuasion, scrum, personal scrum. Yeah, I love personal scrum. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I gotta, I'm pretty good. I guess. Um, so my point here is that don't be – the whole purpose here is to get these articles so that you guys are getting the transaction. So I want to make sure that the really valuable article, you know, it, the, the valuable stuff that you're doing is up here. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's get into video. 
Why do I like video? Well, it's, for the, it's the same reason. It's for this chart. If Charles is an expert, do I really want to, how, the, the way that you should be thinking about it when we're looking at from the web, okay, when we're looking at the, um, how can I get the information, the sequential information out of his head, the insight, the expert advice, the opinion, the unexpected solution? Okay, the unexpected solution comes from a, the, the most amazing book ever, which you guys should just drop what you're doing and just run out and get it. It's called Moving Beyond the Price, Escaping the Price Driven Sale. One of the biggest secrets, I think, ever of providing expert consultation, uh, which definitely Scrum and Agile development experts should be using to sell the services, is providing unexpected, res unexpected solutions for, uh, for major problems. Those unexpected solutions should never be given away. Okay, they need to be behind a firewall. They need to be your level of expertise. You need to know where to draw that line. And that's how you get the sale. By providing unexpected solutions and your expertise, you need to, you know, you can start answering all the questions that lead up to it, but you don't really want to do that. So how do I get that out of Charles' head so that there's bullet points that are interesting but incomplete that are out there on your blog. Well, the fastest way to do that is video and audio podcasts. It's the fastest way to create content. Um, if you had, a, if I had a choice, if you guys getting caught up in writing painkiller content, just keep in mind that this is a script. I could hand this to Charles right now. I could copy and paste this to him, and I wouldn't even necessarily be worried at all about the keyword density or anything like that. I could get on the on the phone or on Skype using Camtasia and I can just hit the record button. You guys know I do this all day long. What am I doing on Fridays with Jimmy and Sue? I mean, he's, and Matt, Jimmy, Sue and Matt are like a thousand dollars an hour, right? <laughs> I'm a thousand dollars an hour with persuasion, right? So when I'm getting their time for free leading up to interesting things, I already know the slippery slope where I want to drive people. In other words, if I'm talking to Jimmy and Sue about backlinking and how to avoid, you know, Google Skyfall and any of the changes, I have an agenda. You don't have to be guilty about having an agenda. That agenda is to make sure that things remain extremely interesting and valuable. You just don't want to give crap. Okay? It's interesting and valuable, but it's not, it's like a mini consultation, but it's not a full consultation. Don't do that. That shouldn't be. Complete means full consultation. That should be up here. Okay, make it incomplete. And so what I'm doing is when I, I'm giving as much information as I can in the audio, and then I really want to, I'll take a transcription, or I'll have uh, somebody on the staff, uh, you know, rewrite the article. For example, you can see by adding that content, this is not painkiller content, but if I'm doing an audio, you can see that I've got the full transcription here, right? I get the benefits from that. I can't tell you how many times I've ranked for stuff in a full transcription. This thing cost me like $4 to transcribe perfectly well. <laughs> I've got major content. Major. And it's unique. Yeah. It's 100% unique. At four, and I have a very good source of, if you guys want my source on, um, on that, I can tell you where that is. Why did all my stuff just disappear? So do you guys get the pick? Now, when it comes to Pain Finder, I actually... This was just a tongue-in-cheek. This transcription is not my favorite kind of transcription to do because I didn't have a list of pains. But my favorite is to take the painkiller article model. This is what we call the vDNA. Uh, and if Charles was ready to take an interview, I'd just interview him. I'd go through this process. And now, an uh, interview is a lot more dynamic, a lot more interesting, a lot more gauging, engaging. You're starting to move towards a, you know, like a talk show. And if you know you're going to get a transcription, which is really, really great, and you're keeping it interesting but incomplete, and you're not giving away the farm, and you're telling people at the end where to go, just remember, so, okay, Charles, so where should I go for blah, blah, blah? It was www.mysite.com, right? And you just make sure that, and what happens when you're providing that kind of engaging content that's interesting but incomplete, you do get those opt-ins. You do get immense value. And if you've actually done it, if the whole theme of the audio interview is three things to avoid, and the interviewer knows that, then you can do that. Now, if you don't have an interviewer, Charles can do this for himself. He can take these things right now, as soon as we hang up today, 
You can go to SoundCloud. You can download Audacity for free. And once you have these three points, if he's lazy as a writer, but maybe a really good communicator, he can have the richest, most important, valuable industry content in the world with probably the only perspective that he has in 10 minutes or less with painkiller article methods. That's great. Okay? Now, keep, now keep in mind, the transcription of that personal article just following these three bullet points, remember, this is a, this is a script, essentially. All we're looking at, you can just turn the painkiller article. In fact, some people I know, I do this, you can write the article, publish it, and then write off your blog, just do the audio, and then when you're done, you in incorporate the audio from SoundCloud, which, by the way, has a domain authority of 89, with a link back from SoundCloud to the article, and you've got the interview. The whole thing takes me less than 20 minutes. I'm talking about the audio, <laughs> and the writing will take me half an hour. The whole, within an hour, I can have a high-quality very, very intri intriguing and in expert, cons you know, insight audio that that's broadcast out to my community. Now, presuming you have things like the OneFeed Supercharger and RSS, if your blog post has a lot of reach because you've set up the OneFeed, you can be broadcasting across, remember what we talked about earlier, your platform. Okay, we can be, exactly. your entire platform is going to be communicating with the market, right? And so once you have that, if you start doing this kind of stuff consistently, guys, it's so worth it just to be the expert and only stick with painkiller article. And when you do that painkiller article method and you follow it up with audio, you syndicate that audio or video even, you can upload an audio to YouTube. Another thing you can do if you want to go to the next level instead of just audio, you can, and the, the ADNA, you can also do exactly Charles could instead of only doing an audio on SoundCloud, he could take these points and he can go to a software uh, that's right online, uh, such as uh, Slide Rocket or any of these slideshow making softwares. You guys familiar with that? He could turn these into bullet points and just really, really quickly in Slide Rocket, you can create bullet points and then you just grab Camtasia, same thing. You capture that screen and he just talks through this article Three things to avoid when incorporating safe, scaled, agile software development in your new business. But he's got video, audio, which humanizes it with the trans. He's got the article. He's got everything. And then he you got the full media. He's got the set. whole media set. And then he hands it hopefully to somebody for the blog, unless he wants to do it. If he's a one-man band, that's fine. Uh, the whole point is that at that point, if Charles is a one-man band, he really wants to make sure that the broadcasting RSS indication on his blog is set all the way up. That means that. His RSS feed should be going out everywhere to all the sites. Okay, this is what we call broadcasting. His uh, Samsung plug-in with virtual backlinks should be installed. In other words, as many automatic things, because Charles doesn't have time to like be technical all the time. He's too busy running a business. So maybe he has somebody do it. The point is, get as much automatic reach as possible. You have social explosion installed there, so it's getting backlinks. And, and then he's too busy building his platform with real people, communicating with his audience. Maybe spend a couple minutes each day, you know, maybe friending a couple people on like on LinkedIn or uh, also on Twitter, and maybe just maybe give yourself an hour. I have a countdown timer where I will do Chris Brogan style thirty minutes and find actual people in my industry that's related to me. I do that thirty minutes every day because that's really building your platform. You need to commit a little bit to building a platform and your reach with people that are in your industry. So I might go to you know Google Plus and maybe go. To over to Bruce Clay's list and like snipe like 20, 30 of his people, friend them or put them in my circle or whatever. You know, just spend a little bit of time. And sometimes you learn interesting things. You make great contacts. I mean, you know, Chris Brogan and Julian from the Impact Equation, you know, they did just a little bit of that. So it goes a long way. So the point is, is that once you do that, the video, the slideshow, the article, you don't have to have yourself on camera. See what I mean? There's some of you who will want to avoid doing the slideshow. I have several clients we're very, very good uh, at what they do, and they just like to talk. They just like to get them in front of the camera. They got that showmanship. They're not in the tech industry. They are more. Uh, one girl really, she's a health and wellness person, uh, and she just she's very, very healthy, and she's really good looking, and she just does a lot of natural and organic foods. And part of you know she gets traffic to her YouTube channel just because she's so good looking. Um, you know, people just see the see her and then just go and watch it. But she also focuses very laser targeted on her audience, which is living 
foods and this type of thing. And she just creates a mass of traffic just based on that. And she just gets up in the morning, even on her bad hair days, she might throw some water on her face and go out on her front porch. And she uses this really rinky dink little camera. And she built a, you know, a hundred thousand person following. You know, she does what I told her to do. As soon as she started to, she was just doing it only on YouTube. She didn't even have a platform or a blog. She didn't have her own platform. She was using a secondary platform or WRS platform. As soon as she started putting in our own blog, that traffic, started going back towards her, right? Pointing back home. A lot of things, when it comes to broadcasting or content broadcasting, you guys, I know it's really simple, but it is true. If you're using YouTube or Facebook as a platform because you don't, you're not a technologist like a lot of uh, health and wellness gals are on YouTube, they just use YouTube as their platform or Pinterest, <laughs> these types of things. That's really the energy going out. As soon as they start directing that energy back to their own platform, that's when they start, that's when you truly own your own platform, your own broadcast, your content broadcasting network, okay? So those are the things that you Russ, do. could you, mm -hmm. at this stage, could you explain the concept of upstream and downstream? Yeah. Because I think it's a... Sure, absolutely. One. When it comes to broadcasting your content, when it comes to a broadcasting network, I'm actually trying to find a pointer on, I think there is one on, uh, yeah, there is, here you go. Oh, no, that's, uh, let me see here. Arrow, okay. Oh, there's no. Ah. Seems like after all these iterations of the software that GoToMeeting would have a set of drawing tools that don't suck. It's really remarkable. <laughs> I mean, it's just like sometimes things are so obvious. I it. <laughs> I know. See, I don't. Okay. So here's the arrow, but it's not going to really help me. Yeah, forget it. Okay, so uh, imagine, oh, actually, you know what? Hang on, you guys. I've already, I've already drawn it, so that'll be more helpful. It's a little animation that I created, actually, for a live talk. This is not it. You don't have to freak out. This is, this is the way that Jimmy Kelly thinks, <laughs> and Sue, and Matt. <laughs> I'm nothing so quite so complicated. Ah, what's that? Oh my God! Um, the the guys, when you get when you understand um, this concept of upstream and downstream, it's going to help you uh, also start grouping your keywords in better ways. Yeah. Once you understand the flow. Yeah, let's uh, take I a, think that's the most important. Thing yeah, let's take a look at this. I think it's pretty important. Okay, so. This is the simplest way that I could reduce. It's it's not easy to, to grasp it at first, but what you guys are doing and the way that we're teaching it, you're actually dealing with three. It's actually five, but you're dealing with three things at once. You're actually thinking in three dimensions, okay? And that's about three more dimensions than most people think about. <laughs> you're actually thinking in four when you include your business. You're thinking about the green arrows is domain authority, what used to be page rank. The red arrows is content. That's the direction your content is flowing within your platform and platforms or your content broadcast network. Okay, as they say in the impact equation and as YouTube says, every human being on earth is going to have their own television show. Chris Brogan says you need to start, also said you need to start thinking as if you were a television station, even if it's content, even if it's SEO. We're actually doing all of them. We're teaching you SEO, content broadcasting, personal broadcasting, business architecture, and uh, content syndication all at once. Now, keep in mind that normally people are going to school independently with different teachers and gurus and instructors for each one of those independently, and they're spending thousands of dollars for each topic or course. We're teaching, all of, teaching you all of it at once, okay? So, for example, the green arrow is page rank and domain authority, okay? What is this? This is your money site. This is the one that Matt's been showing you how to build, so the WR1, okay? It's your site, preferably silo. Does it have to be a silo site? No. If you've got a gun to your head and you have a choice between being in business or not being business and you don't have a silo site, start broadcasting, okay? Get one page up of the bar button now. Yeah, exactly. We're not telling you don't be in business if you don't have a siloed website, okay? We're just making, we're taking you to the nth degree. That's all that we're doing with that. The red arrows is content syndication. This is the direction your content flows through your platform. When I say your platform, I'm considering the entire, whether it's one site or 100,000 sites that you own, including your social media sites that are connected to them, 
that is your platform. I don't care if you have 5,000 Google Plus accounts or five or one, whatever the sum total of all the locations to which you can either instantly or manually publish your content. In other words, let's take Charles. Charles has just done this incredible PowerPoint and this incredible video capture on audio, and he's written the painkiller article method on the three things to avoid when incorporating his type of agile development. Okay, he's going to get really good at getting these things in all these locations in about 10 minutes or less. And he's going to get good at having them be syndicated and chopped apart with social explosion and all these things. In other words, you're just constantly, this is not a static thing. It's actually in three dimensions, by the way. It's actually a torus donut. It's not really a flat land ring system. And guess who the center of that torus donut is? Who's the center? Who's the gravitational core of this? Charles's main money site. That's the site we looked at last week. It's right here. All roads lead to him. If the, what happens is when you keep doing this, let's go one step further, what's next? Traffic. By, with traffic going downstream, domain authority will tend to go upstream. As those sites age and as they get more traffic and as they get more rankings and as they, get, they start to gather links through various means, whether it's above board or below board, they're going to start to generate domain authority. What happens at that point, go ahead and see. Okay, what happens is that traffic, as content goes downstream, traffic and domain authority will head back towards Charles's site. These are three transparencies that once you understand, see, you guys know, you, you guys are trying to figure out like, what's going on in Matt's, and Russell's, and Sue's, and Jimmy's brain. This is all that's ever going on in our brain. Like, we look around the world, we have a, we have a sixth sense. We understand all these layers at once. We don't look at a website without thinking about traffic layer, domain authority layer, and content layer, and business architecture layer. That's four, actually. And the business architecture layer is not on here. See, when Matt looks at this, he's also got another arrow. There's how much money is he getting from these leads. <laughs> okay. That's another layer. <laughs> that could be black. That's the black arrow. We didn't put that on here because we just wanted to get you. Like, you know, Matt would know if you're making more money from number 18 or more money from number 12. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now I, I generally do, but, you know, I have to spend more time focusing on that. That's not my strength. Yeah, right, Welton, he's Mr. ROI, exactly. That's why I call him that. So when you're, <laughs> when you're looking at, and it takes a team, you guys. It takes a team on the bus. You know, if you haven't read, uh, you know, from good to great or great by choice, those are good ideas to be looking at in terms of your own team development. Because, you know, yes, we designed this, though, that it could become a one-man show so that Charles could do this whole thing if he wanted to. Once it's set up, you actually can. My point here is that you've got content going downstream. You've got, with, they contain your links. And because they have links, as those links have authority, depending upon the authority over time, the green arrows domain authority pointing back to you. What's going to happen as, those, as more and more green arrows and more and more traffic points back to your core site? It's just like a sun. This is going to grow. Okay, it's going to grow bigger and bigger, and its gravity will increase. You can consider high domain authority as like having a larger gravitational field. Does that make sense to you guys? You, how many of you, give me a one if you guys know like basic astronomy, like you understand that a sun is better, is bigger, you know, a sun is bigger than a planet, <laughs> and a galaxy is bigger than a sun, you know what I mean? The, the whole idea is for you to become the center of your industry's universe. This is a true thing, you guys. It's a very, very true thing. I'm, I'm talking to the... There's a billion-dollar industry here in the United States called PetSmart that was just bought out, and I know the executive marketing director, and he's actually looking at our company for SEO and blah, 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 and i got to decide, well, geez, do I really want to deal with a company whose gravity is that big, you know, a billion-dollar buyout recently? And, you know, and, and their SEO just, like, completely sucks. This is what blows my mind. It's like, <laughs> they, they, here's a billion-dollar company, and they have, the, like, the worst SEO, like, ever. And it just makes me laugh. But, but why is that? Because they focus on other things. They've just focused on other arrows. They don't have their 20 gazillion products properly organized, right? So Bill is saying more gravitational pull. Exactly. What would happen, for instance, with Charles as he got to be more and more of the authority, not only would the gravitational clout and authority of his site get bigger, but also he himself personally, as an industry expert forward slash educational celebrity, would get bigger and his name, of course, would get bigger. And depending upon the kind of integrity he has and the skill and his certainty, uh, as well as his system, his meme, his personal memes, what, I, what we call epimemes, for us, epimemes are just ideas worth sharing. You know, at TED, they talk about ideas worth sharing. 
you know, if your idea is worth sharing and it's really good and you're a really good teacher, that will get you a long, long way. And if you're able to, this is the problem with broadcasting crap, you guys. If we give you a tool that's powerful and the stuff you're putting out there on the red arrows doesn't reach or touch your market or your platform, it's not touching the people, it's not connecting with them. That's what Chris calls resonance and the impact equation. We talk a lot about the impact equation in Tech Foundation 2. If, if you're not resonating with your market, then you're not going to get these blue arrows become weak. So when you get in industries like SEO, that is just pure SEO, SEO is all about focusing on this green, I mean, I'm talking about hardcore SEOs, right? Hardcore SEOs focus on the green arrow all the time. And they talk about the technical content of that, of the content of the, the red arrows. Remember back in the 2000s, Matt, like 2005 and, or even earlier, where, where keyword density was like, it was all about keyword density. You're like and you, you need 3.4 yeah 3.94 and like you would read 25 yeah. <laughs> and you would read 400 words 400 and 3 h oh my god like we had people <laughs> like oh my Russell I think I got I'm so sorry I have 301 words instead of 296 and I was like really you know and Jimmy will tell you like you got to have certain there are ideal content sizes for certain locations but you got to re, re um, Welton is saying, I like Frank Kern's, Frank Kern's term for money magnets, which pull people in. Yeah, um, I would like, I want to go, f yeah, the sun has a magnetic field, your, your money site has a magnetic field. I would actually like to, I'd like to think a little bit bigger. I would like, I call them gravity wells. We want your gravity well in your industry to be so huge that everything falls into it. You become like the black hole of everybody's attention and energy. And they can't, and literally, if you do this well and your position, if you've done your ISDNA correct, correctly, you become quite literally the only viable option and the gold standard with which everybody else compares themselves to. Or you have a distinction that's so powerful that nobody compares themselves to you, and, you, and that's a good thing. In fact, if nobody compares, compares themselves to you, um, then you're doing, and you're still making decent money, that means you create a distinction for yourself that's so huge that that makes your content more valuable, okay? So this is really what we're talking about here. The black arrows could be added, and the black arrows would be money flowing back towards your organization, or leads. Black arrows could also be leads. Yeah. The transactions. The transactions, yeah. And the transactions need to be carefully thought out. That's a whole other layer of business, okay? So... I'm gonna yeah, we, we cover that in third when we talk about uh, those where you, where you can generate leads through all those layers throughout the thing. That's something we we'll cover certification. Yeah, quite exactly. Important. So your platform is really about getting attention, yeah, awareness times credibility. You see, what's going on is that a lot of the times there's no credibility in an organization, and when you're writing crappy crappy articles or like probably one of the biggest mistakes that I make is like too many typos or or misspelled words. That's really really bad. Like I am very hypocritical of myself. I, I now correct them using, you know, but in the early years, I would have a lot of typos. There's still people that come back to me five years later and say, I can't believe how many typos you had in 2006. I'm like, really? That's what you remember? <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. So you have to really be literate when you're broadcasting and really realize that attention is really awareness times credibility and really stay credible and offer that. I'm going to open up the lines for questions now. I think we've covered that. Your assignment this week is to go and write some of these suckers. Now, I really can't express, I'm very, very, very passionate about you as individuals for yourselves and for your clients properly communicating quickly, and I want to make 100% sure that you understand how powerful to do both slideshow, video, and or live video with written article, but you write the article first before you create it. Give me a one if you understand that that seems obvious, but it's really, really not, and how much more powerful it is in your overall broadcasting. Okay. I'm going to make sure you got that. Give me a two if that doesn't make sense. Everybody understands the power behind creating your painkiller article before you. Yeah, Pat's saying three bangs for one buck. It's a threefer. And if you're really good, it's a fourfer. What's the fourth one? That's the, the lead transaction or the money transaction. Yeah, actually, you know, you're right, Pat. RSS is a really important. RSS is simply, let's go back real quick because you guys are probably all like, wow, what's the one feed supercharger and I can't keep up with you guys, and what are you doing now? And Hey, I'm the, I'm the same way. I, my eyeball started to bleed last night. I couldn't even remember what it is I was doing anymore. Um, I, was, I had a 14-hour day, which I very seldom have, but it was really quite interesting. 
day yesterday because we really the one feed supercharger launch has been great. So if you look at what Pat was just saying, let's just go back to RSS because Matt's going to show you a lot of the initial RSS setup. Um, somebody tell me which one of these arrows RSS would be. Everybody type that in. This is going to be our final question for the day. Some of you are saying red. Let's hear some more answers. Okay, I'm getting red from a lot of you. Keep going. Come on, everybody answer. I'm not <laughs> saying red is the right answer. Okay, so what is red? It could be blue. <laughs> no, it's not blue. Although it can create blue, but it's not blue. Yeah, it's con you're, you guys are right. It's content. But the main thing is, is both blue and both blue and red can come from that. And one of the huge con confusions that people are getting me when they're organizing their RSS feeds for the way that I taught it three years ago, the one feed concept, because I didn't make this very clear. You have to keep in mind if you're creating an RSS feed for, for blue or if you're creating an RSS feed for red. Because yes, you can, you can syndicate your content downstream. Okay, but you can also use RSS to generate content. And Tech Foundation 4, which is launching, that's the final Checkmate course that we have. Tech Foundation 4 is actually how, believe it or not, there is a safe way to 100% pull 100% content from an RSS feed, as Matt will be showing you and I'll be showing you, and putting, placing them out here. If you do it right with no follows, and you're doing it on platforms that are set up for that, and so you are correct, that's red. Also, you, you can send those links downstream, and those links, when done properly in the way that Jimmy is showing you and Sue is showing you, those links give you what? Juice. They increase your gravity of your site. They make your site bigger. <laughs> you become the authority, right? So all of these, RSS is a way, most people out there are, think that RSS is dead and that it's unsafe SEO and that it's not useful. Let them think that. Why? You guys are among the, <laughs> you, you, you want them to think that. We don't want them to know. We don't want everybody in the world to know how powerful these methods are. Okay, this is like crazy. And by using all of these together, by understanding what I call the three transparencies, with the fourth one being the, the business ROI, you are creating a platform. And I know it's a challenge. I know that it seems like, uh, there's, it, it would be easy, here's what I deal with you guys, I'm just talking to you guys like as my friend for a second. You, the challenge that our company faces is that every one of you is generally lost on one of these three arrows. Like you're, you're confusing one for the other or we do focus a lot on SEO. We have probably quite literally the best SEO team in the world that, at least that I've come across and I've been hanging out with Matt Cuss that conferences since 2000, you know, since 2004. I've never seen any, a team like this. I mean, maybe Greg Bozer in the early 2005 from Marketing Gorilla, maybe Bruce Clay. I and mean, these are guys that I respect. But even I've seen our team do things with hacks and tricks that I'm pretty sure that those guys probably don't know exist. But that's all, that's all here in the green arrow, isn't it? All the tricks and tips, like getting your site, I mean, it's a terrible experience to have your site de-indexed and all that, and those gr green arrows just disappear, isn't it? So that's what Traffic Hospital yep. is about. That's what all that stuff's about. You've got to have that. We're in this very weird renaissance period where people need to know a whole, uh, more than a little about a lot. <laughs> it's not, it, no, it no longer gets you by to just know a little bit about a lot of things. You've got to know kind of a lot about a lot of things. So by creating a whole holistic approach to these three transparencies and asking yourself as a business owner, like Charles, for instance, doing Agile, what is Charles good at? Like, is he good at traffic development? Is he good at content? And when you know where you're weak, you can get uh, support with the right person, and you can develop your team like in good to great. It's getting the right person on the bus, right people on the bus first, and then deciding where you're going. Well, you already know where you're going. One of the things that makes Network Empire so popular is we tell you where you're going. This is the only thing going on, whether you know it or not, you guys. You're either building a, a platform, and it's either tiny and puny with no gravity, or you're building a real platform that's awesome with awesome solutions to problems and pains generating an awesome platform and audience with amazing ideas that's expanding infinitely in all directions. There's, there's no in-between. <laughs> you may think there is, but that's something that we tell ourselves because we haven't seen what's really going on out there. So 
Let's go ahead and look at what Pat's saying. Russ, what was the thesis thing you were mentioning? Is it a way of effectively combining your painkiller articles into a book, which becomes of yeah, great, Pat, that's great. I'm going to read Pat's whole thing here. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that. The thesis thing you were mentioning, is it a way of effectively of combining your painkiller articles into a book, which becomes effectively a, a pain lead generator, WR3? Well, yes, I use, uh, interestingly enough, for us, our, our lead generator is actually plugins, free plugins. I cannot tell you how many leads we generate with a free SEO silo plugin. And I'm kind of glad because it means I don't have to write a book <laughs> or an ebook or like the ebook. The ebook method is really good though if you're not in the software industry. I, I hate. I can hardly believe that I hear myself saying that. But giving something away of value, or even a like the way that Charles is giving away the agile development ebook on his site, that's just fine. That something like that of value, make it nice, make it look good, uh, give it. You know, have it be something that. The software that I was talking about was just a simple writing software, and if you guys want to get into writing, let me see if I can find that. Um, I wouldn't get sidetracked on that, but if you do keep it in your mind that your long-term goal, especially if you're not in the software industry, right, doing, you know, comp I wouldn't do what Seth Godin did and take your blog post for one year and then put them in a book. <laughs> you know, that's not what I, what I would really do. But there's a couple uh, softwares out there. Writer's Block was one of them, software for writing. But the one that I really like a lot, I'm trying to find what that one was. Dang. You can drop it in the uh, Skype group if you find it. Yeah, I'll drop it in the Skype group. But I'll, I'll give that to you. It's really nice. There's a format that it uses that actually publishes to WordPress and it's very, very powerful. Um, you'll be hearing more about that in upcoming webinars because I'm just now, there's a lot of transition happening uh, in the way that writing is done, this whole blog to book and book to blog. But for those of you that are in fields like Charles is in, where you're an expert in a particular kind of process, I do strongly recommend that you do either a, a mini book or have a long-term goal of a micro book because what happens when you look at this ring, if you have a book out there, or a video series, or a members area. You know, Charles probably could do a members area pretty easily with some just basic updates and insight. Do you have to weigh your, your, you know, things about that? But as soon as you have a book out there, what you do is the book becomes the centerpiece of all of just in the same way that I used those bullet points in that single painkiller article. Your book can become the underlying axiom. For whatever reason in culture, when you have a book, suddenly you have a Bible that you represent. You have your own religion. Okay, and you're bringing uh, writing a book is like bringing these tablets down from the mountain. You got you're supposed to have a well thought out, like Moses, you know, your well thought out thing, and there's all these outlines, and you're more than just for whatever reason. We're so culturally imbued with this idea that somebody who's written a book is smarter than everyone else. That they so writing books are all the rage. So you don't want to lose money or traction on it, but if it's something that you can have the discipline to pull together in your own time, there's advantages there. You're going to get first of all. You're going to get more gravity to your primary broadcasting site because why? Amazon gets added to the mix of sites. Amazon has huge amounts of clout. So when you start getting links and reviews and buzz, as well as traffic to your videos and links to Amazon from Amazon and YouTube from those videos, and then you start getting interviews, your business, not just your, not just your platform, but your business starts getting massive traction. Your personal brand starts getting massive attraction. So we do talk in our live certification event about how and if it's appropriate for you to write a book, but it is something worth thinking about. And so, I'll, Pat, I'll provide you with some of the writing softwares and the thesis writing softwares that I've looked at. There's some very, very interesting ones out there. And there are some book writing assistants that claim to go directly to Kindle. Okay, and I've looked at a few of those. I feel like the technology is very, very new. There's not a super, super easy way to go directly to Kindle. But over the next 24 months, I'm sure that we'll begin to see more and more ways to take that stuff and go directly to Kindle. The Kindle marketplace is getting pretty saturated, so I would strongly recommend that if you look at a book writing model, you just consider it. Don't don't get overly distracted with it. Just realize it's another way to broadcast content. Okay, and it, what it would be if you wrote a book or even a mini book, it would just be a way to create more content in the same way that we created that painkiller article, and it'll give you a conversation piece and some outlines. Like for example. 
if you've got a book, you might be able to use one chapter as a conversation and talk about it and take questions and audience questions and the rest. So, but you got to keep broadcasting. Pat is saying, not for now, but I have an established track record with hot articles, then spinning them into a book, which further cements me as the expert. Yeah, you can definitely, in fact, that has been done, uh, Pat. People have taken articles. Again, the first person to do that that I know of was Seth Godin. I actually bought his book. Now, one of the things that you have to watch is that his book did feel like it was a bunch of blog posts put together. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like a series of, and he's a smart guy and he's a minimalist with writing. Uh, it was okay, but you know, it's probably $20 that I would have wanted back. So if you're going to do that, you're probably going to want to make sure that each one is, when you're writing those articles, Pat, and you know they're going into a book, it should affect the quality of those articles. Like it shouldn't be like, you know, spinning these things out like, a broadcast, you know, really, if you're going to do that, you won't probably want to go through and rewrite those articles and, and, you know, give it, you know, raise your standard a little bit because stuff in print is less forgiving than stuff on your blog and you can't change it later, remember. So, all right, cool. So I think we're probably good. Any other questions that we can leave you with? Are you guys, your assignment is to go out and do this. Um, write a few of these articles. I want to see what you're up to. Okay, and there's more articles that we didn't go uh, into on this template. If you can't afford the software like Article Factory, uh, which I think is like $70 a year, go ahead and uh, yes. yeah, go ahead and, uh, and just use these templates. Okay, Give me a one if you feel like you have everything you need to go out and create a painkiller article, maybe even do an audio or a video and a blog post in say two hours or less. Give me a one if you feel like you could and two if you're not so sure, if you still feel a little bit woozy. One, if you think you could. Two, if you're not so sure, but you're almost there. Or two, if you're never going to get there. Or two, you're just horrified by this whole thing and can't believe you even signed up for this course. Wow. One, one. We've got a wall of ones coming. Okay. Someone's telling me it would take longer than two hours. Can you tell me how long you think it would take, the person who said it was longer than two hours? That was bad. Um... Weldon is asking about the one-feed supercharger. Uh, Weldon, just contact me privately. Um, Stephen, okay. <laughs> okay, um, th there's a couple people have said, um, okay, great. There's somebody here who said that writing is not their thing. The person who said that the writing is not their thing, are you capable of writing an outline like I showed you with just the bullet points? Are you capable? I mean, do you feel comfortable doing that? You know who I'm talking to? Okay. Um, can, can you also speak? Okay, same for you, Vincent. Yeah, Vincent's saying the same, similar thing. Yeah, um, Vincent can outsource that. Okay, that's cool. So you can gather the point. Interesting. Matt's, Matt, you're halfway through. The other Matt. Halfway done with, okay. You're writing a book? Well, okay, this is a really interesting uh, point. Matt, is it okay if I share your, your issue here? Okay, uh, this is good. Uh, Pat, I just want to address your thing. I, I love your idea, Pat. Just do the bullet points and just talk, your, talk yourself silly and then transcribe it and then maybe just get involved in cleaning up your transcriptions. Another thing you might want to do, Pat, which is really, really cool, is there's a software called Jing. It's free. It records audio and video. Um, you could create bullet points. Uh, Jing is, what I love about Jing is you cannot go past five minutes. I don't know what it is about that software that makes people create better content, and then I figured it out. You can't go past five minutes. <laughs> Whereas Camtasia, you can carry on for hours. So it kind of forces the issue of keeping things succinct. Now, as you get good, you can use whatever you want. Bad side of Jing Pad is you, there's no arrows or screen grab. That's even worse than GoToMeeting. You can't use any. Okay, Matt, I'm going to talk to, to everyone about your case. Matt is saying, my problem is just what to do first and next. I'm halfway done with your book, which, is going, which you were going to try to finish this weekend which implies that you've got hours and hours and hours of the book, unless your idea of writing a book is writing one in, in 24 hours or something, because there are a few programs out there to do that. Should I do that first or do this article first? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Matt, um, Prados I'm talking about. Yeah, fully. Yeah. Matt, you're asking me what you should do first. And I've given you an overview, Matt Prados. Prados? Okay, so you've got 10 hours in the book. The question that we always have to ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of writing a book? Books are amazing in terms of succinctly putting together ideas in a tangible. The books are really, let's just get into the neuroscience of books for a second. The neuroscience of books is very strange. It's the tangibilization of memes and epimemes or ideas. <clears throat> there's, there's things that, that happen immediately. If people feel like you've written a book and it's sitting there, it's this very real object and thing. In fact, there could be nothing in that book and no content whatsoever. And if you walk up on stage in front of a bunch of people who have all been told that you wrote a book and you just slap that book down on the counter, it's this, it's this object, it's this rock, it's thump. Because we've been culturally imbued with this idea that you must be a smart cookie, you must have a lot to say, you must be an expert. There's a book itself, the concept of a book itself has immense authority as proven by Amazon or anything else, okay? So that's the real issue is it's an authority enhancer. You have to ask yourself what you're trying to accomplish with your life. What is your end goal? Okay, and I've written an article recently about Network Empire called Excited But Lost, What Should I Do Next? I can give you guys that article if you want to read it. I wrote it over the weekend. And you have to ask yourself, are you an agency? Are you SEO focused Are you and you're not an agency? Are you uh, SEO focused and you are an agency? Are you a small business or are you a business opportunity seeker? Which one of those four things? Are you? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and add that article. People are asking for that article. Let me find that for you. The reason I'm asking Matt, Matt to me is an, an excellent um, question because the, the question of whether or not you should write a book is a big deal. You've got the right question, Matt. It's under Russell, right, on Network Empire News, it's under Russell Wright Speaks. Let me find that article. I wrote it. It's still a work in progress. But what happened is that, no, it's in uh, month, uh, software and training updates. Um, what happens a lot of the time is people don't really know why they're writing the book. It's called Excited and Lost Help. <laughs> is that a painkiller headline, guys? What do you think? <laughs> I'm going to drop that in the chat room. Well, I want to thank Lorraine, uh, who recently came into organization. Uh, she can't help me come up with the title. The video, I've been told, is a little bit scattered. Sorry, I had a lot of cough, caffeine. But the main thing is, like, you've got to ask yourself, and this is what Matt is asking myself, first things first, where the heck are you? <laughs> Did you guys see this comic strip? Oak Hill Schizophrenia Clinic, you are here. Here, here. <laughs> I think a lot of the times what happens is that we continue to ask ourselves, I think Matt uh, Prados, which I know you're coming to certification, right? Um, my job is, is primarily, believe it or not, is not a technologist, it's not even neuromarketing. It's to help you realize that it's completely normal for you to be schizophrenic. All right, it, that there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that you're suffering from opportunity stress. That's in a nutshell. Um, my friend David Allen, getting things done, he's the one who cured me of opportunity stress. He's the one who actually got me interested in the neurosciences. When I went through getting things done, even though I don't really like the getting things done system, ironically, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, there's real problems with it in terms of, act, in, in terms of saliency or value action management. Uh, we can talk about that some other time. Uh, but it's useful for some things, but really, really bad for other things. Uh, there's no such thing, Matt, as Matt Prado is not, not you, Matt, not no Matt <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as information overload. There's only such thing as potential meaning overload. Let's just really stop and look at that for a second, you guys. This will be, this is the, I, when I understood this principle, I, my company started making, finally breaking the multi-million dollars. I know Matt can also vouch for this. This is when we started realizing what's happening. Do you know what I mean when I say there's no such thing as information overload? There's only such thing as potential meaning overload? Okay. When I look at this screen, um, when I look at... 
And I look at this big, all these dots on the screen, all these arrows. The first, your mind, your brain, and your mind is a part of that right now anyways, um, your, your mind, what you really want to know is what you can afford to ignore. And I'm telling you, you can't afford to ignore any of these things. If you, if you believe that you can generate money on the Internet, if you would like to, if, so the question then becomes, which one of these things in which order? There's no way that Matt or Sue or I could take your personal specific situation and tell you for sure whether you're here, here, or here, right? The whole, where are you? Each, when, every, when somebody comes into an organization, some people are mostly here. Other people are here, but they're, pretty much all of us are, are lost or spread out or split over multiple parts of our business process. When you come to us, it's Matt Cruz's job and my job to try to do our best to get a handle on where you are. In your, we have people come into this course. There's people in this course right now that are worth multi-millions of dollars that are taking this course for the second time. I know you know who you are. <laughs> there, is a, there are people in here who have never made a dime online. How could it be possible that we would have such an eclectic group of people combined paying attention to our training? Why would that happen? And not only that, that we can talk to you pretty much all on an even plateau. Well, it's because the unifying principle of what has to happen in the end in terms of a broadcast network is the same for all of us. It levels the playing field. Every human being on the planet is moving towards having their own television broadcasting system or their business broadcasting system. It's the, it levels the playing field. So what you have to do is untangle and discover which things you can currently afford to ignore. So my question to you, Matt Prados, is can you afford to ignore the book in order to get money. If your objective is to make money today, what is it that you're going to do? Okay, so what, what we're talking about here is I don't, here's, the, here's where it gets really weird, okay? I really believe that you need to distinguish yourself on these three layers. Many are the paths, okay? Let's talk about where you are. Are you an SEO aficionado or SEO ranking focused customer that is not an agency? This is something that I've noticed over the years is a major type of person. I have to break you guys down to the five personality types. If you are a major SEO, you know, you're passionate about SEO, you're a technical person. Remember this whole article came from Lorraine who hates SEO and I met her in the most intense technical advanced SEO training like ever. So the first question that comes up when I ask her if this is what she is, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Can you afford to ignore this? She believes she could not afford to ignore deep, highly technical SEO, which is not her second nature. So we had this huge conversation, and I put her in the right direction. you got to focus on your strengths, okay? Okay, that's one option. Okay, those are the things you should do if that's who you are. Are you an SEO aficionado or SEO ranking focused customer that is an agency? If you are an agency, there's a very specific set of Network Empire tools that you should be talking about. By the way, Tech Foundation 1 training is true for all of these paths. The class that you're in right now, because we cover so much, it's not just SEO. SEO is a huge part of it, but how much market research have we done? How much broadcast preparation have we done? Right? So we try to tell people if they can afford it to take our advanced certifications level 1 at the bare minimum because it gets your head on straight. That's what Matt and I are here to do. Okay, so this is another type of personality. That's personality type two that we deal with every day at Network Empire. The third type of person is a small business owner, and you're not an SEO agency. And again, I'm speaking to you specifically, Matt Prados, because I want to look at whether or not a book is something that's meaningful or whether you can afford to ignore it for a while. Okay, so let's go back to one more personality. Here's another personality we've noticed is very different. If you are a large business or company, we talked about those, and you know who you are, there's someone in here. And then five is if you're an opportunity seeker. Of those five personalities, I would like each one of you to type what you believe that you are in those five personalities. And I can go over it again if, go ahead and just type that in, because that, that will help you clear up the schizophrenia. I am here, here, or here. Uh-huh, we do have business opportunity seekers, okay. 
Interestingly, okay, good. For those of you who are business opportunity seekers in here, two and five, okay, good, Pat, good, good. <laughs> wow, you got three biz op seekers in here. I better go back and rewrite that and be a little bit nicer. Um, no, I'm kidding, I was very nice. I don't mind dealing with that. Okay, so Pat is saying that she, there's a two and a, oh, your agency level, okay, excellent. Business Opportunity Seeker, okay, good. So what I'd like you guys to do is read that article, Business is one, two, and three, okay, good. So Network Empire is not a business opportunity. And I think you guys have started to figure that out. I'm gonna start with saying that. It is not a Get Rich program. We don't do push button millions. We want you, and the way I talk about that here, and it's good that you're here, is what we do is we teach you to grow apple trees, not cabbage patches. You guys understand what I mean by that? Is like it takes about anywhere between five to seven years for an apple tree to grow. And what's really interesting is that's almost in the real world is about the time that I started to see real results in my business. So a cabbage pass is one season, you put the cabbage, you better eat that salad right away because it's gonna go bad really fast, even in the refrigerator. This is what we call click bank. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not building out a broadcast network. Charles has a, a serious business focus, obviously. So Charles, I guess you'd probably be somewhere in the, um, you'd be a business, you'd be number, yeah, so you get what I'm saying. You're a small business owner, but you're not necessarily an SEO agency. And the question for Charles, he was, again, he's a lean, the agile development guy, is does he want to become a big business? Is he gonna go from good to great? Is he gonna expand? What's, see, the challenge that Matt and I face is that each one of you uh, are on a different path. This is not a bad thing, but we teach content broadcasting platforms. And the reason we're doing that, you guys and gals, is that the, the only thing that we would say would be the variance between you would be the size of your content broadcasting platform and the focus. If you've got an SEO agency and what you're selling is SEO, your product focus and what you're, what you're broadcasting, the content that you're broadcasting and the way that you're getting those leads is gonna be slightly different but the principles are true. So again, the content broadcasting network, where we talk about the three web rings, that's the axiom. It's axiomatic to what we teach, and those three transparencies are going to be the same for each and every one of you. The difference will be your focus on which one. If you're an SEO agency, you better know those green arrows really freaking well. <laughs> I mean, so when Lorraine came to me and was talking to me about those, she, I discovered that She's, a, she's an SEO agency who hates SEO. Well, what am I supposed to do with that, right? <laughs> I'm like, you, you got involved. Well, she, what happened is she thought she wanted to be an SEO, and she discovered that she hates it, like really hates it, <laughs> and that she's good with persuasion, and she's great writing. So what's the, uh, that's a business question, isn't it? That's a business architecture, because we had to put her in the right direction, and we had to talk to her about, outsourcing all of the SEO rankings, all the hard stuff that she has to deliver on. She likes selling SEO, but she doesn't like delivering SEO, right? Anybody resemble that remark? <laughs> Guys, that's business architecture. That's what Matt and I cover on day five of certification. If you come to us and you have a terrible business model, we're going to tell you. And what is a terrible business model? Trying to do something that you can't deliver on. Okay, yeah. So she had her hands on something that she hates. What she loved to do was sell it. What she hates to do is deliver it. Well, that's called business organization. She just simply needed to set up an infrastructure where somebody else is doing it, right? Okay, but that doesn't mean that what she broadcasts changes, but it does mean the way that she broadcasts changes. If she hates SEO, but she's selling a lot of it and she can't deliver it, does that necessarily mean that she should be the one writing the content about how awesome SEO is? Probably not, right? <laughs> so this is where we get into business. This is why it's so incredibly important to find out which one of the five paths you are on. And by the way, if you're on a business, if you're on, a, if you're still a business opportunity seeker, I'm not putting those down. I just want you to know that we are not a business opportunity. We've never presented ourselves as a business opportunity, and that we are a empire building system. And I suppose you can view the building of an empire as a business business opportunity, but because it takes a while to kind of get your bearings and get a, you know, 
get clear on these transparencies and how they work and to drive that money back to this transaction point. Biz ops are telling you that, that it's a cabbage patch. Yeah, just do this, buy this push button million system, and get this thing, and you're going to have cabbage the next morning. Okay, well, you know, you can definitely mill out a couple cabbages by certain opportunities out there. But you're not building a, a long-term brand. You're not building a long-term rapport with your audience. And you're not, definitely not building a solid platform where five years from now, you know, I knew Chris Brogan's work like five years ago. He's gotten better and better. You guys, some of you guys knew my work and Matt DeCruz's work and Sue's work up to 10 years ago. And we've gotten better and better. I'm embarrassed by some of the articles I put out in 2007, but hey. I'm still around. I still laugh, and you guys still know who I am, and I'm trying to make you happy. Matt and I are going to do our best to help you. That's called brand building and rapport building over time. So with Matt Prado's stuff, I'm going to come back to Matt. Can he afford to ignore the book? Book is definitely about long-term brand building, but Matt's got to ask himself, what is his business model? Is he which which one of those things is he fine? You know, is he is, you know, is he a small business? Is he going to be big business? What's his goal? Is he moving towards a liquidity event? And that's business architecture. And if Charles is saying, okay, my lean, my agile development system, I would like to be the new gold standard, and I'm, I'm willing to take on the entire industry, and I'm going to have 10 staff members and a teaching staff in our own building, and I'm going to try to get bought by, you know, what is, it, lean, what is that software or whatever. <laughs> you know, some of these guys build software to actually get a bot. That would be a business plan. That's an intent. And you have to take that type of intent in mind before you decide what's important. So the hierarchy of need that, that we're dealing with here, when it comes to your painkiller article, really does speak to where you guys are trying to go. Okay. So what to do first, what we call, what Sue and I call a list of uh, saliency. You guys know the word saliency? Is how important is something to do next. Doing the right things in the right order is very specific to your business is not something that our organization can tell you what to do except when it comes to building your platform. So that's why it's important to realize whether or not, you know, for example, we have people coming into our organization who are taking this course right now. They don't have a product. Okay, there's one of you and there might even be a couple of you, you don't have a product yet. You're learning to build before you have something to sell, right? Okay, well, it's a very important, let me give you another example. My stepson, is a genius uh, gamer who is now publishing dozens of videos per work to YouTube and getting like thousands of followers on YouTube, right? Eight weeks ago, I told him that he might want to monetize his YouTube channel. He might want to just go ahead and flip that switch and start getting checks from YouTube, right? Nine weeks later, nothing. There's no monetization happening, right? He hasn't bothered. Why? He's too busy gaming. You understand what I'm saying? That's a business decision. He's 14. I'm not going to worry about it. You, understand, you guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, he's probably, he probably would have re received anywhere between $200 and $300 a month on ad revenue if, if he'd stopped to turn on the AdSense and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, just come and get me when you're ready, right? I can't tell. He's 14. I don't want him to have to get a job and be, be in business, right? But here's the point. is like we all act like we're 14 sometimes and, and don't get things set up, right? So he would rather play video games and upload them and communicate. He's having fun than make money. All right, but he knows the steps. I've carefully laid down the steps. I opened up AdSense for him. I showed him how to turn it on. So this is the issue. The issue is doing the right things in the right order is also a choice. If you don't have something to sell, you're not going to have a transaction. So those business hierarchical decisions are best. The closest layout that Matt and I have for you on those, those types of decisions are in the graph that's normally only given out to certification students, okay? But we have a much better and bigger layout this year, okay? That's what we call future-proof empire. Have you guys seen that diagram? If you want the outlay of making decisions that are beyond this course, there's a lot of stuff on here that are beyond the course that Matt and I are talking about right now. These are the things that you've got to do. You must have all of these at least happening if you're going to break five million a year, okay? You want all of these, futureproofempire.com. You, if you look at the blog post that I just sent you on which of the five personalities are you, combined with futureproofempire.com handout, okay, and this handout used to be $10,000, keep in mind, or 
uh, $15,000 certification event. It's one of many things, but if you do these things on here, okay, if you, this is the business architecture side. This is way beyond the course that Matt and I are teaching you right now, but it's related. Your product optimization is here. You can have your vision and your strategy, but if you don't have something to sell, it's never going to get anywhere. So get really, really clear about that. And then your pain, that's the vision, that the articles really are broadcasting solutions around your product. All roads, including your painkiller articles that we discussed today, should be monetized with yourself. Okay? I was having a conversation yesterday with, uh, can, I tell, can I talk to you guys about something that's kind of controversial? Give me a one if that's cool. It's a little bit on the, it's a little bit on the, how shall I say, it's, it's, about the, it's about the adult industry. Can I say anything? Is there anybody? Give me a one if there's somebody who's offended if I talk about that. I'm not going to say anything bad. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, cool. Um, this is a person who, <laughs> Matt's like, <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a person who uh, was, in the, it was in the adult gold rush in Romania. Uh, he still is. They were making anywhere between three thousand and seven thousand dollars a day. Let's just talk again about future proof. Okay, I talked to him yesterday for an hour and a half because you know I've known him for a long time. I've never been an adult, but I like the software that gets developed out of adult because it has to handle serious stuff. You know, the, some of the click software in that industry is pretty hefty uh, and other stuff. But what all of a sudden, you know, where they're down now, he's down to less than three hundred dollars a week. Okay, well, there's a lot of different things that happened there. What happened in terms of looking at it in terms of a broadcasting industry? Well, the model of making money was other people's products in adult banners, driving clicks to membership sites and, and these types of things. And then all the IT debt that Matt talks to you about, don't even get Matt DeCruz started on IT debt. He'll like teach you, he'll, he'll put you to school and you'll know like where every single dollar is being spent and how much money you're not making. It's horrible. But then he'll save you a ton of money. <laughs> he'll be like, uh, I'll be like, yeah, man, I'm making money. Matt's like, you made 73 cents. I'll be like, oh, okay. Screw you, Matt. <laughs> um, so that's, it's okay. But just this is what you got to realize is like it's a numbers thing. And so in the adult industry, what happened is that all – these guys were building these large networks and developing these this IT debt with these servers and pin vid site type things and you know software systems like uh, you know Pintastic and all these other things and these are a serious adult server scripts. Vidfetch has a lot of these things, and they were monetizing other people's stuff. And guess what happened? The adult industry started to feel the burn of a lot of the coming down on them that the search engines did and and actually huge competition and really bad SEO, believe it or not, in the SEO industry, unless it's Black Hat. And Google got in front of those bad SEO techniques really, really fast. Like, you can't do them anymore, what they were doing. Uh, and, you know, cloaking techniques, which were actually done pretty badly. You can still do those, but they were doing pretty badly. And all of a sudden, they've got these giant networks of all this IT debt, like Matt DeCruz will tell you. And then the banners and the commissions and everything went away, and the programs changed, and how they changed, how you made money, and they watched a massive, also human behavior changed, where people weren't getting leads on those over video pop-ups and all these types of things. They just weren't. And everything was just this mayhem, and the bottom just fell out of the adult industry. It still is, except for the very, very few, except for the webcam industry, uh, which is actually starting to feel the burn right now. What's happening is that it's normalizing. Normalizing means the network of adult and hu human culture is changing. As soon as something is everywhere, you guys, and so readily available, people start to lose their interest in it, or else you know they go down different paths, or it just changes. So these guys were stuck with all this IT debt, and they didn't build anything that was sustainable that directed them, to, unless you were the owner of a particular type of adult site, or a major type of site that offered a unique type of product, or fetish, or service, or whatever it is. Okay, or, a, or actually, believe it or not, an adult brand. <laughs> Unless you were, even the adult industry is subjected to the laws of gravity of this adult center of a brand that people recognized that was sustainable. I know that's weird, but it's a true thing. So any of, this, any of the giant networks that weren't driving traffic and generating content that was uniquely branded with a unique standard and a unique type of idea failed. 
So even these rules that we're talking about is true in any industry because you've got to build your own, it doesn't really matter what it is, but you've got to stay consistent with what it is that you're doing. And you always get back, you know, you hang out with that type of crowd, you're going to get the results of that. And for the most part, there's a lot of really not very cool business people in that industry as well. And they won't hesitate to negative SUO you, right? It's just all the values. You just want to stay away from that type of thing in terms of the values, in my opinion. But that being said, you can learn what happened. Had they built, I talked to this guy, and he was like, man, I really wish I'd, I understand what you're saying now about building a sustainable major site at the center of your ring. I'm like, right? <laughs> because you got $150,000 in IT debt of servers sitting out there that are generating traffic with no money. And you can't find a program that's monetizing well on those adult sites anymore. And they're not going anywhere. And guess what? If he had his, if he'd been developing his own business at the center of it, and he could get, put a banner. He said he's got something like uh, 18 servers and like, you know, 20 million pages, right? He could put his own banners out there on those sites, like I teach in the PinVid course. And he could be driving all that traffic to his own lead gen and his business architecture would be generating revenue from, instead of having IT debt, he'd just have a giant lead net. Uh, he's built everyone else's business. Yes, he's been, he, right, exactly what Matt would say. He's built everyone else's business, he's got this massive IT debt, and the CPA and the CPMs are no longer working for him. He can't get paid very well for them anymore because porn clicks are a penny a thousand now. So that's where, or actually more than that, more, less than that actually. So. What can you afford to ignore when you become irrelevant like the adult industry has to those kinds of systems because they're too easy, they're too saturated? If Matt, if building Matt Prados, if writing your book is going to help you seriously build your brand, if your book is good enough, show the outline to somebody. If it's going to help you build your core center and if it's going to make you get on a show like Oprah and, it, and your model is really a consulting base, There's, look at the uh, Future Proof Empire that we teach those processes and look at your organization and your core central model and your brand and then decide. In the meantime, you can't, it's not either or, Matt. You can't stop blogging because if you do, I mean, getting your blog platform set up, even Chris Brogan says in his book, The Impact Equation, even if you've got nothing to sell <laughs> yet, you guys are doing the right things. Get the blog up and going. Prepare the platform. As you begin to build your inference, it's not either or. There's parallel processes happening. You're building both your business and your platform. Start the conversation. Uh, you know, again, Brogan talks about it as if you're walking down Main Street. The way he describes it is if you're walking down Main Street and it's the only time you've ever been out of your bedroom and you're trying to get to know people because you're in a, you, know, you really need a job, you're out of money, all of a sudden your money disappeared overnight. If nobody knows you and you haven't been walking down Main Street and saying hello to the baker and people in the park and getting to know people and having friends. It's a hundred times harder to create a joint venture partner, to get on the right bus with the right people and create a team than if you've, if you've had nothing to sell and you've, you've been out there communicating on your social media platforms. So start to build your platform. You guys are doing the right thing. But remember, a lot of it's about relationship and getting to know your industry and your community exactly. before you do it. Exactly. You don't want to just go out there That's and say, hi, I'm Matt DeCruz. You don't know me, but I need a job. Please help. <laughs> yes, <African laughs> so Matt, Matt Prados, that's what I would say about that is you know, everybody look at their business model, look at Future Proof Empire, again it's a huge sneak peek about what we talk about, this is what we call business architecture, once you've got that figured out, you're going to crush it, as soon as you have that buy button and you know what you're selling, let that drive your actions, and it's not necessarily an either or, I've got, I've got three different books that I've been working on for over a period of five years, don't give up on those things. Just ask yourself, where is the transaction? What do you, how much money do you need? And how are you going to be generating that money? Okay. Yeah, what can I sell now? All right, that's all I have for you guys today. So. That was awesome, Russell. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, good. Should we wrap it up then? Yeah, no, I think the guys have got a lot to think about. Yeah. Um, last thing I want to say, guys, is so do you see how the, the technical layer of selecting keywords how the persuasion layer sort of overlays on top of that transparency. Everything's transparency, everything's stacked. So that's why we, we start at the top of the vertical, we work our way down, we then come back around, we think about our story, we, we extract those keywords, we drop them into the conversation, and we keep on stacking as we work through this process. So everything's just one step at a time. One step at a time. Everybody got their assignment? You're going to go and write a painkiller article, and if you've got the guts, I want to hear or see an audio or a video. 
and I want to see, and Vincent, if you're going to have somebody else do it, let me see a copy of what they did. You, Matt or I should at least see a copy. Um, and if you've got the guts to share the audio or the video that you've done, we'll definitely share it in one of the upcoming events, one of the upcoming certs. I mean, sorry, uh, one of the upcoming trainings. I'd like to at least make sure that you guys have done your, your homework, okay? The first time you do it, it's the hardest. But once you do it after that, you're just like, you wake up in the morning going, oh, I could audio video, auto video post about this. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's just, it communicate with your audience, guys, just like we talk and chat yeah. and on Skype or on GoToWebinar. That's all you do. Yep, exactly. All right, you guys, this has been great. Uh, Matt DeCruz, Russell Wright, this has been Network Empire Certification Level 1, Week 4. Uh, you know your assignments. Uh, so glad that some of you guys could come back again to re-audit it. Please do, uh, those of you who are old-timers <laughs> or salty dogs, uh, please do show up for the certification level four. Matt, Sue, myself, we're working on this too. It's the first time you've ever presented this RSS stuff for automatic content generation other than PinVid. Uh, you're going to love it, so if you can afford to make it. Also, any of you guys who are in this course, feel free to attend as well. We will see you next week, uh, Thursday, for week five. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thanks, guys.